Hey guys welcome back. This is a story about what if Naruto became the Lord of the Foxes. The fight at the Valley of the End is over and Naruto has won the battle, but the war is far from over as Kakashi arrives on the scene and kills Naruto. Or so he thinks. Kayubi has other plans and won't let his vessel die. Instead Kayubi sees the potential in Naruto and decides to take the boy under his wing to make him a warrior of legend. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel and leave a like you can suggest a Naruto fanfiction with a link in the comments if you want me to read it. And check the description for the creator of this great fanfic and support them for making this fanfic. So let's start. Chapter 7 Fall of the Snake Sanin Part 2 At the moment with Yugido, Ni Yugido found that if she were to take the title of Mizukage of Mist she would need to know more about it as a whole and the populace that went with it. While looking around she noticed that while most places looked filthy and disgusting like slums from the other places she visited this one was a lot worse. She had visited the hospital with Rin before leaving the Inazuka to her duties and saw that Rin's place of employment was sterilized clean despite what the outside of it looked like. The same could be said with the various restaurants, libraries, and the Mist Academy itself, though her demon-enhanced senses told her that there was still the air of blood from Momochi Zabaza's day of terror there so long ago when she just was a child herself. Now she was walking through one of the streets that looked barren of life with nothing to show except trash and rotting food staining the ground. What a fool the Mizukage is to let his village fall so far like this, said Yugido in a silent and whispery voice that only she and her demon heard. Well well look what the Nibi dragged in, said Hidan from behind Yugido, who turned around to see the man wearing a black coat with red clouds and his partner now behind her. You. I thought I left the two you back in that village on the edge of Kumo's border, said Yugido getting into fighting stance and got ready for a fight. You would be wise to rethink using the Nibi's chakra here Yugido-san. Unless of course you want the people here to think you possess a bloodline limit, thus making you a much hated target among the populace, said Kakuzu smiling knowing that the instant she does anything that is unnatural will be considered a bloodline and the people will pay them a large sum of money to have such a person killed. Like you would let them kill me without taking what you want from me you bastard, said Yugido, who was not going to let them take her without a fight no matter what. Regretfully true, but in a sense what we will be doing will result in your death after we extract the Nibi from your body once we summon the other members for the ritual, said Hidan having no problem not killing the woman just yet, as she will be dead soon enough when the beast inside of her was removed. Now what makes you think I'm going to let you? said Yugido looking between Hidan and Kakuzu wondering which member would strike first. Or would they strike at the same time? Or me for that matter, said Kenpachi letting loose a great deal of chakra pressure that made Hidan and Kakuzu nearly suffocate under the strain of the intense power. Yugido was able to hold herself almost perfectly calm since she had experienced much worse from the boy when he learned of his parentage, though there were still beads of sweat coming down her face nonetheless. Oh crap it's the Kayubi container, said Kakuzu remembering what Itachi had sent in the letter to them via Falcon Messenger about how Demon Vessel used his power to make everyone around him weak in the knees. Yeah I'm his container and proud of it, but if you are going to call me anything I would prefer it not be that. I hate it when people call me by such titles and not by my designated name, said the boy sitting up from his crouched position on a roof of a nearby shop with a huge grin on his face. Yakiru quietly jumped off her Ken-chan and sat by the edge of the titled roof to watch the soon-to-be battle with amusement as the fight was about to take place got started. This is so exciting. Now I just have to remember to do that thing Ken-chan told me to do if any missed ninja show up. What was it? Ask for some kanai. No, I have them. Ask them for candy. No, Ken-chan said I had a limit and I reached it already. Oh I know. It was to make sure that no one interferes with Ken-chan's fight. Yay. I remembered, thought a happy Yakiru knowing her father was going to be proud that she remembered what he wanted her to do. Well tough brat. If I want to call you, Kayubi boy, demon brat, or any other more colorful names that come to mind I will and not a soul here can stop me, said Kakuzu with a grin having ignored Pain's words of wisdom involving fighting the two vessels. What about fighting someone without a soul? said Kenpachi grinning again before he ran at the man with his sword out dragging against the ground leaving a lined scar in its wake. He's fast, thought Kakuzu backpedaling away from the boy, who looked more like a wild animal than a human being. The Akatsuki member didn't know just how right he was when he thought that, as a now sword-wielding Kenpachi smiled his devious smile. 
In one moment he was in front of the red cloud wearing man and the next, he was gone. He's very fast, thought Kakuzu amending his statement by a single word wondering just where the the boy went while going through hand signs for one his infamous jutsus. Die, said Kenpachi from behind Kakuzu before plunging his sword into the man's now split in two heart, while the dying man in question wondered just how the the kid got behind him so easily without making a sound since it seemed impossible. The Kayubi brat had bells on his hair for Kami's sake. Before Kakuzu could figure this out, Kenpachi twisted the blade almost vertically before slashing to the right cutting the man almost fully in half leaving a very bloody mess all over both Kenpachi, Kakuzu, and the ground beneath them. By this point, the mist Anbu appeared behind Yakiru waiting for the right opportunity to engage the remaining Akatsuki member, who found his retreat blocked off by Yugito. Oh Mask-kun. I'm sorry, but Ken-chan is busy fighting right now so you will have to be patient or come back later, said Yakiru not bothering to turn around to see the group of Anbu behind her, who looked at each other wondering how to respond to the child. Listen brat we don't answer to you and the Mizukage sent us here to stop the fighting, said the missed Anbu captain before he and his team took several steps forward ignoring Yakiru's growl of sudden anger. Ken-chan is fighting and you are not allowed to disturb him. Go away yelled Yakiru in a scary voice, flaring her chakra into a manifestation of what looked like something between a cat and a fox with enough force to send the Anbu ninjas flying back several feet in fear. Hidan for the most part remained calm despite the fact that he had the Kayubi vessel in front of him, the Nibi vessel now behind him, and the missed Anbu to the side with a girl whose power was somewhere in the high Chunin or low Junin level. Very carefully in a fluid motion he readied his, holy, staff of Jashim into battle position ready, to fight this enemy knowing that due to his immortality he couldn't be killed. You cannot beat me boy no matter how much power you have. For I have been blessed by Jashim with the power of immortality and I will defeat both you and your cat brethren behind me, said Hedan, who mentally thanked Jashim for this day for when he would be able to shed blood of those around him. For Hedan it had been far too long in his mind. Well at least one of you idiots had the brains to bring a weapon and not to simply rely on jutsus to get the job done. This might actually become entertaining. Let's find out, said Kenpachi charging at Hidan, who readied himself for the onslaught that was soon to come. Yugito had been surprised at the boy's speed, skill, and his overall strength when he had killed Kakuzu without even breaking a sweat. I mean, even she hadn't seen the eye patch wearing Gaki, not that she would dare call him that move at first, only to hear the soft jingle of one of his bells seconds later before he killed Kakuzu. How the Akatsuki member never heard it was beyond her, though it was probably only due to Yugito's enhanced hearing that she heard it. Hidan felt himself being pushed back every several feet or so by Kenpachi as he blocked the many blows from the boy's sword. The only problem with blocking though was the feel of the intense pressure that was making him slowly losing ground behind him. By the fifth hit Hidan decided to pull a hat trick and hit a button on his staff revealing his secret weapon. It was in the form of a small, but still sharp knife-like blade hidden at the very bottom of his staff he used for when the occasion arose to outmaneuver and ultimately kill the said enemy. As Kenpachi pushed Hidan back a one more time, the Akatsuki member struck spinning the staff at an angle where it would cut into Naruto's mask and into his face just above his left eye. However, it didn't seem to phase Kenpachi at all despite the fact that the said spiky-haired boy was bleeding ever so slightly. The fact that the kid in front of Hidan was now grinning and laughing like a madman through his mask was a dead giveaway. So he had a tolerance to pain. Let's see how much, thought Hidan, as it wasn't very deep and slashed down leaving a thin scar above the boy's left eye all the way down into the cheek. This knife was designed to override any form of healing a demon vessel produces no matter how powerful it may be. Even with a healing rate as fast as yours, any hit I make with this blade, no matter how deep, or how long I make the wound, you will have scars on such place for the rest of your life, said Hidan trying to make the boy more cautious of him. What it did was have the opposite effect. It made the boy laugh a Sykwevich laugh before he turned serious. You really think such things frighten me when it comes to getting scars. From the very way Kanaha's villagers and ninja treated me when I was a younger I should have more scars all over my body than the Hyuga clan have members. Don't insult me on how you didn't knowing how I was treated since it's more than common knowledge on how people like me and Yugito are treated, 
said a now angry Kenpachi, as the faint memories of the past once more reappeared in his mind only to shut them out if only for a while. You still can't beat me on account of my regenerating abilities that grant me immortality I need to survive in all attacks you may deliver, said Hidan getting in a weapon stance once more. While technically that is true, I think your form of immorality is far from perfect. Let's see how you like being cut up, burned into ashes, and then having your remains sealed away in an urn before tossing you into the depths of the sea, said Kenpachi grinning once more before locking swords with Hidan. Only this time he grabbed the man by his left arm with his own, and threw him over his shoulder onto the ground with a immense strength creating a mib hole in the process. Before Hidan could remotely try to counteract this hard-hitting move in some way, his opponent acted to prevent the Akatsuki priest of a member from providing any form of retaliation. Kenpachi grabbed and pried the staff out of Hidan's hands before throwing it to Yugido, who incinerated it with her Nibi's chakra. By this point Hidan had stopped being calm and actually looked afraid, as the pointy tip of Kenpachi's sword slammed into his right open palmed hand preventing him from just simply using the escape jutsu or the substitution all ninja are taught at their respected ninja academy. Single quote dot. I should have listened to leader Sama when he said avoid a confrontation with the two vessels should they be together, thought Hidan finally remembering the man's exact words before they left. There is just one thing I would like for you to do for me before I decide to continue any further Akatsuki-san, said Kenpachi breaking the hand and wrist of his prey to prevent any one-handed signs that he recalled Haku could do. What is that if I may ask, said Hidan knowing that it wasn't like he had choice in the matter when it came to his death, at the hands of this monster that currently stood over him in such a superior way with the one seeable eye beyond the mask glowing red and yellow. Scream for me with everything you've got, said Kenpachi laughing before he started on tearing Hidan apart limb by limb creating a huge gory mess to Yugido, Yakiru, and the Mist Anbu, who were too shocked to even move from their spots. When it was over Kenpachi was a bloody mess and the ground before him was covered in blood, guts, and the death of two deadly members of an evil organization. With a simple yet few hand signs Kenpachi soon incinerated the two with a fire jutsu of his own design called, Demon Foxfire Jutsu. Unlike normal fire jutsus this one was demonic in nature and thus was more potent than the standard human variety that all shinobi learn. Also another difference was that when Kenpachi wanted the flames to be gone all he had to do was snap his fingers and it was just die out faster than you would blowing out a lit candle. When the fire died out with a snap of Kenpachi's fingers the boy pulled out the used and still bloody bag that once occupied the residence of Hoshigaki Kisami's head. Then in a masterful act of wind manipulation, seeing how it was his main element, the vessel of Zanjetsu gathered up all the ashes from the two corpses, and placed them in the bag just before tying the top of it in a knot. Okay note to self. When I become Mizukage and he eventually become the first Shikage of his hidden village make an alliance with him and fast. Thought Yugido knowing that anyone who fought this kid was already dead. Yakiru then jumped down from her spot on the roof and landed on Kenpachi's shoulder cheering her father on about tearing, Monk Chan, to pieces. The trio or rather duo and a half however, were soon stopped after being surrounded by Mist Anbu looking at the group hesitantly. Kenpachi Sama, Yakiru Sama, and Yugido Sama you will all come with us to see the Mizukage about the events that just took place, said the Mist Anbu captain hoping he young man would comply and not use brute force. Fine it's getting boring here anyway and I need to tell the Mizukage about the guys I just killed though I don't think he's going to care since they were both SCL missing ninja, said Kenpachi offhandedly, as if he were talking about the weather before they were all headed towards the Mizukage tower once more to explain some things to the pig of a cage. T Country one week later Kimamaro looked on with Zanjetsu at the research complex Orochimaru had set up to use for potential experiments on the people of this poor country. It had been difficult at first, since word had gotten out about the albino's death thus requiring Zanjetsu to play along while calling himself a servant of Orochimaru and had saved Kimamaro from dying while saying he was dead to avoid the Mist Hunter ninjas. Something that Kimamaro swore on his life never to repeat to anyone about the demon lord saying those disgusting words. During the time period that they spent in tea country, Kimamaro ran into a girl, who had been used as an experiment of the now late head scientist whose name had long been forgotten by them and from their memories of the research complex. She, reluctantly at first, 
told them her name was Isaribi, and after she had explained to them why she was the way she was along with why the people hated her, she was offered amnesty as well as amnesty in the soon-to-be-built village hidden in the Shinigami. Once the shock wore off she jumped at the chance to start anew and Zanjetsu promised to use his demonic powers to see if he couldn't help her with her transformation. If it wasn't for the simple fact that Zanjetsu was a terrifying demon lord, even in human form, Isaribi would have gladly hugged the entity with all her strength. After explaining the situation to the people of tea country that were around them they apologized for their actions to Isaribi not understanding what had happened to her which resulted them in acting the way they did. Now the people of tea country in that area had a new problem to deal with and that was their now destroyed town that they resided in. Fortunately, Kimamaro had proposed to all of the people of in the town in tea country that they could temporarily head to wave country until Kenpachi's hidden village could be built. Thankful for being given such a wonderful opportunity, since they had heard of Wave's recent freedom from the late Gato and its sudden economic growth, they gladly accepted. Now with the future residents through the demonic portal that led to Wave Country on the other side Kimamaro turned to Zanjetsu wondering what was next. While Isaribi, who had decided to stay behind at the demon lord's request though why he did still confused her. Where to next Zanjetsu-sama? said Kimamaro knowing they were making great strides in their progress in creating a new hidden village with only the land needed to create it. First, I have to take Isaribi to the demonic limbo realm so I can fix the many genetic as well as cellular complications that fool of a scientist did to her. While I am doing this I need you to go to wave country yourself and speak to a man named Sano, who runs a smith that ranges from weapons to masks. I need you to speak to him on making more masks for us and others as well. Tell him we want top quality masks that are the same shape design as Kenpachi's with different shapes, various types of marking, and the multiple copies of the animals in question, said Zanjetsu opening up the portal to Limbo for Isaribi while leaving the one to wave country open. What about after the order is placed, said Kimamaro knowing he would have to do other things besides wait for the masks to be made. While that is happening, you are to train until I come to see you again with the others since they are healing nicely from what I have sensed. You will be with me when I speak to the four again to convince them to join our cause in destroying Orochimaru along with Sound Village once and for all, said Zanjetsu knowing all about the death of the two red cloud wearing members of Akatsuki having already received a telepathic message from Kenpachi. Understood. I will start right away Zanjetsu-sama, said Kimamaro bowing to the great demon lord before heading to the portal to wave country to fulfill his given task. He takes his job way too seriously, said Isaribi wondering just how devoted the albino was to the demon lord and his vessel back in water country. Maybe so, but considering what my vessel and I have done for him, I wouldn't have his loyalty any less than it is now, said Zanjetsu walking towards the portal with Isaribi, who followed the taller demonic entity. Konoha Hokage Tower Two weeks later, Hanada approached the Hokage's office with shy yet strong determination on her part as she had no intention of going quietly into the cold dark night as Kiba and Sasuke's wife. She had every intention of being strong even if she was bound to them so no matter what may come of her life whether as a slave in all, but name or died by other means she would go out strong. She knew of only one person, who could do that and it was the current Hokage in office. Hokage-sama, said Hinata forcing herself with some effort to prove she was not going to be the weak shy girl everyone thought she was. Yes Hinata please come in and have a seat, said Tsunade knowing that this meeting was important to the Hyuga girl or else she wouldn't have demanded to Shizune to make it. Demand an appointment with the Hokage of all things. Shizune thought she was going to have a heart attack when Hinata did it in such a fierce way. I'm sorry if my demand for this appointment with you has made me appear to be rude or disrespectful towards you Hokage-sama, but I felt that I could only talk to you about this. I wanted to say to you and only you that I do not approve of this, marriage, that I have been placed in against my knowledge and my will. After a great deal of soul-searching came to the conclusion that if I allowed myself to be married to my chosen husbands that I would be strong in the end. To that end I want you Hokage-sama to teach me anything and everything you know from fighting to medical teachings. I will not be part of this so-called marriage and spend the rest of my days being weak like everyone seems to think I am, said Hinata looking at Tsunade with a determined face not wanting to back down from this choice in her life. Possibly the only real choice she had left. 
If that is what you want Hinata I will help you become strong by making you my new apprentice so in case you are married to those two idiots, you can still keep them in line from time to time seal or no seal, said Tsunade knowing that from what Hiyashi had told her in secret, that the clan elders were making the Hyuga seal masters work almost non-stop to make the new seal for Hinata. Thank you Hokage-sama, said Hinata bowing before leaving the room to train for the rest of the day and possibly visit her mother's garden that was her sanctuary. Naruto wherever you are I pray that should you find out that I was once again powerless to stop what happened here, said Tsunade once Hinata had left the room and she poured herself some heavy duty sake. At least things couldn't get any worse in the world, thought Tsunade as she looked out the window of her office and at the now repaired stone head of her grandfather that was the first Hokage. How wrong she was. Jiraiya came in through one of the open windows before Tsunade could even react to try and punch in him surprised as she was that he came in so abruptly. Tsunade Haim. You are not going to believe what I have just discovered from my spy network, said Jiraiya looking at the female Hokage with seriousness and slight panic. What? Is it about Naruto? Said Tsunade knowing that the toad Sanin before her must have used Gamabunta only recently to reach her after being a week away in Tsuna. No. I asked the case cage for help in that area, but he was as stumped as I was on where the kid is officially hiding out. What I came to tell you was that just two days ago, Kumo had a coup de tat. The soon-to-be Yandaimi Rakage became too impatient and successfully innated the Sandame Rakage to advance to the position ahead of the estimated timetable that he was supposed to be inaugurated in, said Jiraiya knowing that the people had mixed feelings for the man given his policy on their formal demon vessel and the investigation into its own Anbu unit to what happened with the Hyuga clan over a little over decade ago. What? This can't be good. What's going on with those loyal to the Sandame Rakage? said Tsunade knowing that the Yandaimi Rakage was not as nice as his predecessor. A sizable chunk of them were slaughtered during the chaos while the rest have taken what they can and got the out of there before they lose more people to the insanity. The people that are power hungry stayed wanting to receive the power new Rakage is promising all those, who stayed to let his plans come to fruition, said Jiraiya knowing of the man's plan for the Nibi vessel that was once a ninja of Kumo. Who else knows about this outside of Kumo? said Tsunade knowing they would most likely have to prepare for what lay ahead with the Yandaimi of Kumo. If I had to guess I would say Akatsuki, Orochimaru, and possibly the people in Wave Country, who are taking in refugees right now due to the close proximity between them and Kumo, said Jiraiya knowing that with this new rakage in place no Hyuga clan member family or branch were safe. It was widely, but secretly rumored that the man from Kumo that was killed during the said incident was the older brother of the man now in charge of the rival village. The worst case scenario was that Kumo would make an alliance with another village to take down Leaf in its currently weakened condition. At least we know the people that left Kumo are safe from harm since Kumo won't dare invade Wave on account of the political standings it would have to face with the other countries. For now we won't have to worry about an invasion just yet, but to be on the safe side double the Anbu guards at the gate and the patrols outside the village. The last thing we need is for a strike force to hit us, leaving a major dent that will take a good size of our dwindled resources to repair, said Tsunade knowing they would have to fight for all the strength they could get that once flowed so easily into Konoha that had turned into a small trickle. Thank Kami for small favors. Yumsunade Haim I think I have an idea on what Naruto has been up to since he left Konoha and everything, said Jiraiya hesitating slightly not knowing if telling the woman was a good idea before making up his mind and sat down in one of the chairs knowing this may take some time. Well, spill it out. Tell me already, said Tsunade wondering what could make the Toad Sanin so hesitant in regards to Naruto. Well I'm not certain if the information is solid yet, but I think it's a start. As you know I've had my spy network gathering all sorts of information that it get or come across and in doing so they heard a few disturbing rumors, said Jiraiya, as the information given to him based on these rumors possibly did not bode well for Konoha. Get to the point you old super pervert, said Tsunade getting impatient with the toad Sanin having to restrain herself from pummeling him or another object for his stalling in telling her what she wanted to know. Old. Well if that's not calling the pot calling the kettle black. If it wasn't for the fact she could pound me into liquid paste I would tell her as much, thought Jiraiya, as he almost dared himself to say such thoughts out loud knowing that it would put him in Kanaha's or a ward at the hospitalagan. From what rumors have gathered there is someone spreading the word to very select few people about a new hidden village popping up soon somewhere. 
the founder of such a place is offering it to any missing ninja, who wish for sanctuary from being on the run from hunter ninjas seeking their heads. This person accepts normal people and those with bloodline limits no matter how weird, strange, and dangerous they may be into this place. The only thing that is required to join the place is absolute loyalty and defending their new home should the time come to do so, said Jiraiya wishing he could find out more than what was given to him by his network. They don't know who the supposed cage of this village is, said Tsunade knowing that Jiraiya's spy network could find out just about anything if they wanted to. They've tried, but it's all very hush-hush stuff. All they know is that this man or woman has sent two people, which they know of, out to gather as many people willing to be a part of this new hidden village. Rumor has it the one man is albino with white hair and every time he speaks of his master it is nothing short of fanatical devotion to him. One person thought it was a joke and was stabbed in the throat by a white pointy weapon similar to an ice pick, but too wide for it to be such a thing. The speed of this albino is said to be fast so I'm guessing he's about Junin level that is close to either Kakashi or Guy himself, said Jiraiya having looked over the information he received. And the second person, said Tsunade wondering if she could compare them with any of the faces in the bingo book since if there was ever a description of them, they could be identified immediately. The second guy is clearly the brains of the two and someone, who doesn't like to be in one place too long unless it's necessary. This guy knows where to go, when to leave, and how to get any destination they need to with a snap of his fingers. One minute he and the albino are in one place and then they're gone the next after rounding a corner in some dark alley. Creepy stuff really. Not only is that weird, but another rumor I heard was that they busted up one of Orochimaru's test facilities somewhere in tea country. They freed the enslaved people there and somehow helped them get to wave country since almost all of their homes were destroyed, said Jiraiya not understanding how someone could get a large group of people from tea country to wave country in such a short amount of time. How is that possible? Is this person remotely human or is this some kind of new jutsu we haven't seen before? Said Tsunade thinking what Jiraiya was for once that wasn't related to his perverted ways. He could be another demon vessel or some other entity we haven't encountered before on account of all that's happened during the shinobi wars and the kaiubi attacking. On the other hand it could have been one of Orochimaru's experiments that got out of its cage and decided to stick it to our old traitorous teammate, said Jiraiya, as he listed off all the possible ideas of what that person or thing really was. Whatever those two are I need your spy network to keep close eyes on them along with Kumo, Orochimaru, and Akatsuki, said Tsunade knowing that Jiraiya's spy network though vast, could only do so much, and gather everything and anything from all of the mentioned parties. The only question is where they are going to set up shop. It's not like they can just do that anywhere these days around here and the only way I can think how is to invade and take out another village. There is a good chance they could set up shop in Wade, but if the bridge were ever destroyed then the country's economy would soon drop to practically almost down to what it once was before the bridge was even built, said Jiraiya, as that was the only place that came to mind in building a hidden village. We'll worry about that later if and when they make their appearance to us when they do come together for such a thing, but for now we have other pressing matters, said a now tired sounding Tsunade, who wondered how the third was able to do this job as long as he did. Well if that's all then I'm going to get out of here. Oh and if you are going to summon I would advise you not to. I summoned Gamabunta and he asked me about Naruto, said Jiraiya rubbing the back of his head knowing that by now every single summons both good and bad knew what happened. You told him, yelled Tsunade on him moments later ready to beat the living crap out of the stupid old self-proclaimed super pervert. How could I not? He told me he had heard a rumor that come from the weasel summons that Tamari girl from Suna has and from Kakashi's own dog summons, who swears that he saw the idiot make the hand signs for the Chidori. Gamabunta outright threatened me to tell him just about everything or else he would have killed me and never help Konoha again should anyone summon him or any of his subordinates to, said Jiraiya cowering in fear at the woman with her angry face and her raised fist with super strength. Then you should have died with dignity, said Tsunade clearly pissed at Jiraiya's choice in the matter. Would you with your summons, said Jiraiya wondering what her response would be. I don't have to worry about that since I'm a sophisticated woman, said Tsunade, though she would have secretly done the same thing if placed in such a position. From the way you drink, gamble, and punch I'm not so sure, said Jiraiya in an offhand joking manner, which of course earned him a mean right hook of a punch to his face that sent him through one of the office walls and into the village below. 
super perverted jerk, yelled Tsunade at the top of her lungs before heading to her desk and set up a D-ranked mission to have some of the genins fix her office wall. At the Aburame clan house, Shino was sitting down with his father in his private study sipping tea made just for the clan wondering how things could have fallen so far in the village he had called home. The ripples of what were happening around them never seemed to stop for even for a simple mere moment and it was suffice to say it was become annoying and agitating. At least by Aburame standards at least. Do you think my conclusion of what we must do is valid my son? said Aburame Shibi sipping his tea looking at the younger version of himself beyond the shades that hit his eyes. Yes. Logically when a person or people cannot live or adapt anymore to the place they call home it is only natural that they would need to move to some place they can. During the recent events that have taken place since the mission to retrieve Uchiha Sasuke I have found enough sufficient data that I can come to the conclusion that this village is headed towards a downward spiral that will destroy if not consume all. Therefore to survive not only as ninja, but as clan as a whole we need to move from our home to seek out another that may accommodate us and may even allow us to evolve like the bugs we hold have time over the ages, said Shino finding the marriage of Hanada to both the Uchiha and his teammate of an Inazuka both horrible, barbaric, and illogical all at once. In Aburame clan the queen was considered to be nourished and protected at all times for she was the very source of the bugs themselves. Thus, it was only natural in the sense of the word for the very children she created to protect her in times of danger should it ever arise. The very nature of this so-called marriage Hanada was put in went against everything the Aburame clan stood for and it sickened them to no end. To place rules on the mother of the children of a future clan and treat her like she was only there to breed for the male amusement made not only the Aburames themselves upset, but every bug in the colony was buzzing with anger and outrage. Further proof you don't have to be human to hate the way the species would operate in certain moments in time. I have spoken to the head clan members of those I both trust and respect. They all agree as well as believe that Konoha is falling apart and even by some miracle that it could be put back together it would never be the same again. They know with Uchiha Sasuke now pardoned for his traitorous actions, being trained to become the sixth Hokage, Uzumaki Naruto being declared an SCL missing ninja, and Hayuga Hanada's arranged, special marriage we feel it is necessary leave with our clans to safer grounds said shibi as he had spoken with the naras akamichi and inoichi clan heads about this to hear their opinions on the subject what of hayuga hiyashi said shino knowing that the man didn't hate naruto and loved his daughter that was now sentenced to be living in with two male arrogant pigs that had egos the size of the hokage monument he cannot leave his clan no matter how much he wants to the elders are watching him carefully as well as his youngest daughter, who will no doubt be his successor. If he were to leave now he or she would be unable to protect either of his daughters and his nephew in the branch family Neji. The boy would also suffer in the man's place due to that illogical seal on his forehead that enslaves him to their will. Like the captain of a drowning ship, Hayuga Hiyashi must spend up until the end of his days with the clan while trying to keep the elders from poisoning the mind of the one daughter he may be able to yet save in this drama, said Shibi knowing that every time he came over to the Hayuga compound to talk with Hiyashi the feeling of being watched by prying Byakugan eyes made his skin crawl with discomfort. If we were to partake in such an endeavor how should we do it and when? said Shino knowing that timing was everything and that if word got out to those like Danzo or the other council members that were against them all would be lost. For now all we can do is plan if only in secret. When the time comes we will know and then and only then shall we make our move, said Shibi finishing his tea and letting out a long sigh from deep within. Whether it was a sigh from the tea or due to the stress Shino was not sure. Village hidden in the mist hospital, Uzumaki Kenpachi was smiling at his newest subordinate Madurai Makaku who for the life of him couldn't help feel he was in for one of a ride. After the whole incident that involved the two Akatsuki members, the eye-patch-wearing swordsman of a prodigy used this moment to further drive a much deeper wedge between the two brothers that at the very moment, ruled over water country. Keyword being moment. Through a few tall telling lies, though not impossible ones from Kenpachi, the Mizukage that was Octavos was becoming suspicious of his older brother and Daimyo Gendo. A man whom Octavos now suspected had sent those two members of Akatsuki in order to innate him to rule over both ninjas and the samurai guarding him. Octavos for the most part had always trusted his brother when it came to the political arena involving the events taking place in water country. 
However, Octavos was never one to underestimate a person's ambition for greatness and to do so with his own brother could possibly be the death of him. So with that being said the Mazukaj decided to forego the test for Kenpachi and the other three members of his group for helping avoid such a horrible, disaster, that would have been the Water Shadow's death. Now they were in the hospital as the man that two weeks prior had gotten his shiny bald-headed butt handed to him was now getting out of the said building to recover at his dust-covered home. Or would have had a fire not broken out during the two weeks Akaku was in the hospital and burned it to the ground with what small, in number, valuables he had inside. That was where Kenpachi came in, as after a simple request from the Mizukage he was able to get the bald man the rank of a Miss Junin. The one and only condition stipulated that Uzumaki Kenpachi would be given the title of Anbu and have Akaku along with any others he saw fit be placed under his command. This meant the man would be staying with him at his home with Yakiru, Yugido, and Rin since Akaku had nowhere else to stay. At first, hearing this idea, request sounded strange to the Mizukage, but after Kenpachi had explained that from what he had seen in the ninja ranks so far, that even the Junin lacked the need to have necessary discipline, the Mizukage agreed. How could the man not? The man may be a pig at heart, but one that wanted to keep his village under control no matter what and this was it. The Mizukage knew that he needed someone of even higher rank than the Junin themselves to order others of that rank or lower around. Plus it would help to remind them all that the rank of Junin and to an extent Chunin didn't give them the right to do whatever they wanted. Thus it was for all purposes required of Anbu and captains that were much higher in rank to pull on the loosened chains connected to leashes of Junin and Chunin from time to time when they got out of hand. The Mizukage agreed to everything Kenpachi said, seeing how this still growing boy had done nothing, but good for Mist and such an idea would allow better control over the ninja ranks below him in case riots or other disasters struck. The Water Shadow had also mentioned to Kenpachi that due to two of the seven swordsmen of the Mist being dead, one more missing, that the remaining four were in the dungeons of Mist itself for several years now. A spy in the northern part of Water Country was undercover as an employee of a man, who ran a brothel house and learned from one of the girls that one of her more, long-lasting, customers was one of the former seven. The swordsman was soon tracked down with the other three staying in the same place to ensure safety in numbers in case of an attack. An entire Anbu and Hunter Ninja Legion was sent to the location where using various Genjutsu to sleep Jutsus were able to capture all four of them without any casualties. Unfortunately, they found that the four swordsmen had long passed down their swords to the four other apparently stronger apprentices scattered throughout water country. They were all taking different types of mercenary jobs to put food in their stomachs to survive another many long days of blood and death. What good fortune it was that Matarei Makaku just happened to be one of those four young swordsmen he needed to find. With any luck the final swordsman or his apprentice for that matter would be found to join the ranks of those around him in greatness. Wait a minute, are you saying that even though I'm now at the rank of Junin, but I now report to you because you are in Anbu? Said Akaku staring at the boy in disbelief that a kid younger than him would have a higher rank. Or the hair gods out to get the poor bald man or something. Yeah by direct order of the Mizukage himself and if you got a problem with it you can either speak to him or in a more direct approach me. Said Kenpachi glaring at Akaku, who seemed to shrink several inches under the stare. En no en need k Kenpachi as sama, said Akaku as the beating he got from the boy in his mind was recalled by the replay button and he shivered at the sheer intensity of that one-way fight that landed the bald warrior in the hospital in the first place. That and staying any longer would make him the patient of that female Dr. Rin and the last thing he needed was to be hurt by her again too. I still think she jabbed that needle into my on purpose, thought Akaku remembering how she said it was to help the antibiotic already running through his system. He would have believed her had she not rammed it hard into his right butt cheek with the supposed super strength of the slug Sanin herself. Just thinking about it made Akaku want to rub his sore behind good because if you so much as complain or question my orders I just might make you get sent the hospital again and put you under Rin's special care, said Kenpachi enjoying the sight of his newest recruit paling at the thought and did not under any circumstances want to go back to that woman for treatment. Death was far more painless. Again no need Kenpachi-sama I will obey your orders, said Akaku no wanting to show any weakness by stuttering in front of his superior ninja officer. 
follow me then. I sense we have much work and training to do that was left incomplete by your previous trainer, said Kenpachi knowing that with one swordsman down under his direct command there was only three more left to go before the Mizukage's days of ruling mist were over, Kenpachi would have the other apprentices sooner than later. One of them according to Zanjetsu was outside of the land of water wandering around the other elemental countries with his wife. They had already, but secretly accepted the offered prospect of joining a new village to escape Hunter Ninja from Mist. Kenpachi couldn't help, but smile as it would be only a matter of time before the other two targets were found and brought before him to see just how strong they were. Mist Village Training Ground Number 4 Many hours later. Akaku was out of breath having fought his new sensei for so long all the while simply trying to understand how he got caught up in this situation in fighting such a powerhouse of a kid. Truly the hair gods mocked him so. The two were sparring against the other with Kenpachi holding his own and even going as far to taunt Akaku saying, if I wanted a decent fight I would pick a fight with a guy or girl with a full set of hair. This of course upset Akaku to no end for obvious reasons before he called out his sword's name, with it being Hozukimaru, thus transforming it into a deadly looking spear, and he re-engaged Kenpachi once again in the battle. Though the end result, despite Ikaku's improved skills, and abilities was the same as the last encounter they had painful defeat. The only difference was that Akaku didn't need to go to the hospital, but just stay in bed after this fight for about 2-3 to three weeks. Not bad Akaku. You have lot more talent than I gave you credit for. Head back to my place and get settled in since there is more than enough beds and rooms to sleep in, said Kenpachi watching the bruised body and ego of Akaku limp painfully away to the said home. Man he is going to be sore tomorrow. At last he knows his sword's name. Thought Zaraki Kenpachi that resided in sword of its owner, who took on the same name. True, but I wish he didn't do that. Lucky dance, of his that he does before a fight. It's almost as bad as Meita Guy and Rock Lee hugging each other with the sunny beach genjutsu they somehow put up. I'm so glad I left Yakiru with Yugido since I don't want the girl to be traumatized any more than I can let happen thought Uzumaki shaking his head at the horrible image of the two plaguing his mind. She may be safe from that, but Yugito is not from the energetic antics of your daughter, thought Zaraki smiling in the mindscape of his owner, as they both wondered what type of mischief the fox girl was getting into. Before they could think on this any further a three-tailed messenger fox appeared before the boy before bowing in respect to him. Forgive me if I am interrupting anything Kenpachi-sama, but I have important news that you must hear that came from the summoning world. The source is from none other than the boss summons Gamabunta himself, said the demon fox raising its head to meet the gaze of the masked Kenpachi. What news? said Kenpachi curiously raising an unseen eyebrow behind his skull mask. The one you call Aero Senen told Gamabunta about what happened between you and the traitor Hata K. Kakashi at the Valley of the End. Word has spread to the other types of summons in Konoha and they are infuriated with the hidden village. The tracking dogs that Hata K. Kakashi summons will no longer obey him in terms of summoning. They have even gone as far as to cancel their contract with him to show everyone in the summoning world they don't support his traitorous actions. They wish the honor to try and serve you instead or someone you deem worthy of the contract itself said the three-tailed demon fox though not liking the idea of dogs moving in on the territory that was theirs when it came to the one who summoned them serves the bastard right for betraying me like that anything else said kenpachi as he looked at the fox before him which looked hesitant to reply for some odd reason there is one other thing though i don't know how you will take it it is in regards to the girl you like that smells of lavenders, said the demon fox getting an instant and terrifying reaction as the chakra pressure came down on the fox like a five-story house. What about Hinata? What has happened to my lavender heim? Speak, said a now paranoid Kenpachi getting a bad feeling about all of this. From what I gathered from Gamabunta, who was quite angry at the time, it seems the council in Konoha has arranged a marriage for Hinata. Not just any marriage, but a double marriage in which she will marry two people instead of one, said the demon fox still reluctant to tell more to Kenpachi knowing full well what the response would be. What? To who? W-H-O? Said Kenpachi with his charka creating even more pressure on the summons than before, though the fox knew it wasn't intentional just that the boy was very emotional. The arranged marriage is with both Inazuka Kiba and in Uchiha Sasuke, said the three-tailed demon fox bowing his head in regret and shame at being the one to tell the one, who summoned such bad news. 
E R R R R R R R A A A A A A A A A A A H H H H H H H H H H H H Yelled Kenpachi letting his rage and chakra spiral out of control consuming his entire body making look like nothing, but an eerie shadow surrounded by blue, red, and yellow chakra. It was fortunate for the fox that he left for the amount of power that was unleashed would have most likely destroyed him. What's going on? Why are you angry? Thought Zanjetsu feeling the wave of unmatched fury from deep within the demonic realm of Limbo. Read my mind and you will know the answer, thought Kenpachi in a demonic voice even inside his head, as his anger seemed to never end. This is sickening even for me. It seems we need to speed up our timetable in creating a new hidden village before three years is up. To do this we need to destroy another hidden village and rebuild from the ashes of it. Any particular place in mind? Thought Zanjetsu after he read his vessel's now raging thoughts and felt almost as angry as Kenpachi did. Yes. Orochimaru in his precious sound village in rice country, thought Kenpachi, as he felt his bloodlust growing along with his hate while he bathed in his own chakra. While for everyone else in the world that felt his fury it just meant another bad sign of things to come for those, who were Uzumaki Kenpachi's enemies. I will make the necessary preparations. I'll take you there when we're officially ready to strike, thought Zanjetsu before cutting the connection with his vessel and watched over a now recovering Isoribi from the procedure of removing her deformities while keeping the ability to breathe underwater. One might never know when such an ability could come in handy. Somewhere else in hidden mist, at that very moment, Yugito was just as angry like Kenpachi was, as the Nibi cat demon known as Yoruichi had given her vessel a summoning contract with other types or kinds of demon cats. The first act of summoning one of her new demon cats, was to regretfully inform her of the Sandame Rakage's death at the hands of the man's successor. The Kumo of Yugito's past that she remembered with the Sandame was no more and all ties that bound her to it were gone. She silently vowed that when she became Mizukage of the Hidden Mist Village she would have her revenge against the new Rakage one way or another. Sound Village three days later, this cannot be happening, bellowed Orochimaru looking over the reports he had just read from his agents he sent into the field to find out what was happening in tea country. The snake Sanin had become very angry when his agents he had there were not sending him weekly to monthly reports on the all the progress his experiments were making. So far the agents he sent were giving him less than satisfactory responses and it was apparent that if he didn't get good news soon Orochimaru would be taking more heads that he did not need right now. I'm afraid so Orochimaru-sama. What's more is our most secret complexes, hideouts, warehouses, and outposts all around rice country have either been annihilated or have gone silent. We just recently lost contact with the Fuma clan both loyal and disloyal to our cause, said Kabuto not understanding how so much of what his master had built in regards to Sound Village could be torn down so easily. It was clear in regards to certain places that whoever was doing this had key information only someone close to Sanin would know and could use against him. It was because of that little fact that Kabuto was very nervous under the gaze of the man despite knowing that he was fully innocent of such thoughts. There had been others, who had known about such places when Kabuto had been in the room with Orochimaru and where the plans had been discussed in detail. However, as far as Kabuto and Orochimaru knew, such people were all dead now leaving just the medic ninja with Glees as the only suspect of such things. It certainly was not Orochimaru himself as he needed Sound Village to wipe out Konoha and to serve for the main part of gathering potential experiments for future usage. The only logical culprit in this whole crime that fit and left to cast blame on was Kabuto even though for once in his life Kabuto was innocent of such crimes. For once, Kabuto wished he was still a member of the Leaf and not in the presence of the Snake Sanin right at this very moment. And how do you intend to fix it my loyal servant, said Orochimaru saying, loyal, with a great deal of venom, as he no longer trusted Kabuto anymore with what was happening to his once great village. I do not know how Orochimaru-sama. If we send our forces out to investigate they may not come back and if they stay here it will make them question you capabilities as cage of sound said Kabuto knowing that what he said was true and held no lie for the Sanin to detect. Orochimaru narrowed his snake-like eyes at his right-hand man, who only recently he had suspected of betraying him outright with such acts of betrayal. It was common for a lizard to chop of its foot or tail to live, but never the other way around and for Kabuto to do just that didn't make sense to the sound shadow. 
Even now it baffled the man as Kabuto was right here before him kneeling like an obedient servant when now of all times would have been right to betray the Sanin with dissension already growing in the ranks. What was causing this? Who was causing this? The answer soon came in the form of an explosion on the outskirts of the village walls that Orochimaru had ordered built should Akatsuki decide to attack. The walls were built with complex seals designed to take MIB punishment from Jutsus and various other abilities bloodline or otherwise. What the devil is going on? Said Orochimaru heading outside to investigate along with Kabuto, who he made sure stayed out in front of him. When the two ninja got outside they saw several sound anbu that were stationed inside the underground complex already at the ready outside. Unfortunately what the group saw was shocking beyond words, as the only person they knew that could possibly do what they saw was supposed to be dead in the last of his clan. There were pillars of bones everywhere coming out of the ground in all angles with the blood of sound shinobi running down every single one of them. Each of the victims had a horrified look on their faces that spoke volumes of how painful the experience had been for them. How do you like what I have done with the Orochimaru-san, said Kimamaro looking at his former master with silent, but nonetheless deadly hatred. What? What sorcery is this? This cannot be Kimamaro. It can't be. You were dead, said Orochimaru reading the report about the albino and the other sound four members that failed during the mission to recruit Sasuke to his side. You should know better to trust everything you see Orochimaru. You will find that first impressions can be deceiving, said Jirobo appearing behind Kimamaro folding his arms over his chest now wearing black pants and vest with his hair spiked in a mohawk-shaped design. Yeah. Just because you gave each one of us those stupid eating curse seals on our stupid necks like the stupid pricks we were back then, doesn't mean we would simply die whole, said Tuyuya wearing a tight anbu mirrored clothing the color of blood with a shadowy black symbol of an oni demon on her back. We never were able to repay you properly for treating us like crap, making us fear you fully knowing that you could destroy us if we spoke out of line, and sending us on that suicide mission for the Uchiha kid, said Kitamaru cracking all six knuckle before doing the same to his neck. This is some sort of trick. You were all reported dead. How is it that you all still live? said a now worried Orochimaru knowing that if those four were very much alive, then it was possible that the other one was still oh crap. Oh boss. Miss as much, said Sakin with Ukan literally right behind with his head sticking out of his brother's back each of them smiling at the Sanin with sadistic smiles on their faces. Tell me then before we begin this little dance. Who is your new master? I demand to know, said Orochimaru seething inside that those five who once served him, now served another. Not like it matters since you're about to die you snake, but FYI, if you had sense at all you would have paid more attention to your surroundings, said Tuyuya pointing right behind the Sanin. The Sanin's eyes widened slightly and turned around slowly to face his enemy partially just enough to see the figure before striking like the snake he was. Unfortunately, for the man what he saw shocked him so much he couldn't even move when his one eye saw the figure before him. Or rather figures. Oh Orochi Tem. How have you been? Steal any good bodies lately? Committed more crimes against humanity? Or I guess the much more appropriate line of questioning is this own how many more cages that were in their late 60s that was like a grandfather have you killed? Said Kenpachi, as his original smile had turned into a fierce looking scowl that was hidden behind his mask that covered his only slightly scarred face. Kenpachi had left Yakiru with Akaku, Rin, and Yoruichi to play with while he was here on business to deal with the snake Sanin knowing that if she was here she would have become a target for the man to prey upon. The second figure was also scowling as well with a dark crimson cloak swaying in what appeared to be an unnatural wind. The figure's name was Zanjetsu. You've cheated death long enough Orochimaru. It's time you pay for your sins and go to like Serutobi Sandame intended, said Zanjetsu his eyes glowing red and his fangs now revealed to the Sani, who now knew just WHO or rather what Zanjetsu was. He was the nine-tailed fox. Kayubi, said Kabuto looking at the demon lord in fear knowing that the fox's power could destroy him and Orochimaru without breaking a sweat. Impossible. You were sealed up by the Yandaimi all those years ago. It's not possible for you to be out like this unless your vessel was dead, said Orochimaru before he went through some hand signs and summoned the boss snake Manda to the battlefield. Orochimaru. Why have you summoned me? Where are my sacrifices? Said the boss snake looking rather pissed off at the moment with the man on his head. These are your sacrifices Manda. 
Though few in number they are strong warriors only for you to devour, said Orochimaru playing to his summon's vanity, which seemed at the moment his only edge in controlling the giant snake. You must have run out of weak people to give me for offerings. How disappointing of you. For now I will fight for you, but the next time you summon me I want 5x as many sacrifices as this, said Manda looking down at his prey ready to devour them all whole if need be to fill his stomach. I'll take him. Kimamaro will go after Kabuto while Zanjetsu kills Orochimaru, said a calm yet now smiling Kenpachi drawing his sword before going through quite a few one-handed hand signs for a demonic jutsu. So the insect thinks he is the predator now. WHO do you think you are? bellowed Manda striking out at Kenpachi, who had just completed the last hand sign. Me. If I let you live through this I may tell you, but considering how arrogant you are I think it's best if I just turn you into snakes too. Demonic art. Anti-summoning chains jutsu, said Kenpachi sending chains of both his and demonic chakra onto Manda that seemed to burn into his skin making him let out a scream of pain before each line of the chains of chakra seemingly fading away leaving burning like tattoo marks seconds later. You bastard. What did you do to me? Screamed an irate Manda feeling as if his very flesh beyond his skin was burning up and that his body was hard to move like it was covered by an invisible weight. Both Orochimaru and Kabuto were also just as confused as well as worried. As the name of the demonic jutsu implies it creates a series of chains sued on a ninja's summons depending on the size of the actual summons. The jutsu requires a good supply of my chakra that comes from within me that is both my own as well as the demonic stuff I get from Zanjetsu Sama. What it does is prevent any summons covered in those chains from returning from where they were summoned and prevents them from moving around in battle, said Kenpachi bringing his sword to his and ing it sadistically at the giant snake, who felt fear crawling around his already pained body. If the snake had a spine it would be shivering right about now. This can't be happening, thought a frightened Orochimaru, who turned in time to see a now wounded in the ribs Kabuto fighting against a seemingly not even trying Kimamaro, who seemed to have become much stronger than he had been mere months ago. Before the Sanin could react further he felt the side of his face being kicked by the ever-powerful Zanjetsu, who was now delivering his own kicks and punches to the man. For his part Orochimaru attacked back trying to repel the demon fox and even using quite a few of his jutsus involving water, fire, and earth at his disposal. Zanjetsu dodged them all and kicked Orochimaru right off Manda and left after him fully intent on finishing the fight on the ground with the sound four waiting for them to prevent the slimy snake from running away like the coward he was. I believe it will soon be time for me to get into this fray, said Kenpachi quietly almost a whisper to himself, as he saw Kimamaro summon Tanpas made from his own bones due to his bloodline limit dead bone pulse with the tips at the end razor sharp so they could cut into or through limbs or other parts of a person's body. Kabuto with his chakra scalpels ready engaged Kimamaro despite his lethal injuries he had sustained at the hands of the albino and charged again trying to beat this foe before him. I don't know how you got this strong Kimamaro, but don't think for a fact that it puts you at my level. I'm on par with Hata K. Kakashi himself and the likes of you are nothing, but mere insects compared to be an Orochimaru-sama, said Kabuto trying to hit a limb or cause some form of injury that will hurt the enemy before him. Kimamaro didn't bat an eyelash at the remark about being compared to Orochimaru, as it had little significance to his life, but he had been told about the dark history between his master Zaraki Kenpachi and his former sensei Hata K. Kakashi, who had betrayed him at the end. That had infuriated the albino bloodline user to no end as Kimamaro now had pictured Kabuto's form being overshadowed by that of Hata K. Kakashi. In that moment, Kimamaro's eyes raged with nearly unmatched fury and attacked with devastating blows to Kabuto, who upon seeing the eyes of the albino knew that this fight would be his last. Kagaya Secret Art. Dance of Blood Bone said Kimamaro lacing his tonpas with his chakra sliced through Kabuto's tenants in his arms, legs, and his heart after putting his two tonpas in a X shape over the man's chest before unleashing the killing blow, which turned the man into bloody chunks. Nicely done Kimamaro, said Kenpachi smiling at the man's battle skills when it comes to killing others around him. Thank you Kenpachi-sama. I am glad you approve, said Kimamaro, who simply bowed before leaping off of Manda and joined the others on the ground with Zanjetsu, who now was a bloody, armless, and practically defeated Orochimaru on his knees with the lower part of his jaw missing. Now Manda I think it's time that I deal with you, 
said Kenpachi Ng his while he let out a sinister chuckle that made Manda struggle even more. Wait. Wait. Don't kill me. I'll serve you if you spare me, said Manda hoping that by some miracle that the warrior before him would accept his offer. Kenpachi shook his head giving an infinitive, no. No Manda, for you have caused nothing, but pain and suffering on those, who did not deserve such hardships and what's more is that you disgrace the title of summoning just by demanding sacrifices of all things. And for what? To show everyone you are the best of the legendary three summons. Such arrogance like yours is pathetic and deserves only the most appropriate of punishments for such crimes. Which is why I can't think of any other punishment better than the way of death. Said Kenpachi leaping onto Manda and slicing as he went moving from place to place along the boss summon's tail making Manda scream in pain. Finally, after cutting Manda down, to literally half his original size, Kenpachi decided to end the snake boss's pain in a very gory fashion. Leaping into the air he crashed down onto Manda before many lightning fast slices killed the boss summons creating a very bloody aftermath all over Sound Village. However, for Uzumaki Kenpachi it was as if he got the gift he always wanted lots and lots of blood. Smiling at his handiwork Kenpachi turned to face a near lifeless Orochimaru being held by the throat in a death grip by Zanjetsu, who had made the Sanin's eyelids forced and held back with several Sanban needles supplied generously by Tayuya. That girl along with the other Sound 4 spent a great deal of time in limbo not just healing, but training as well. Each one of his new members of his soon-to-be-hidden village had spent all the time focusing on their weaknesses so they could be twice as powerful as before. Can we kill this pedophile now? Please Kenpachi-sama, said to Yuya in a sweet tone that would have made people not knowing her think she was an adorable girl. Both dangerous and swearing, but adorable nonetheless. How can I refuse a growing woman such a request? Zanjetsu-sama I believe would like the honor of it since Orochi-tem has been nothing, but a pain in the to the two of us. Anyone here want to object? Said Kenpachi looking at the other five, six if you counted Ukan, ninjas before him with each one shaking their heads knowing that Zanjetsu was the infamously fear nine-tailed demon fox and therefore outranked them all. This can't be happening, thought Orochimaru before he felt the vice grip that was on his throat tighten even more before lifting him up like he was nothing. Say oh to all my buddies in for Orochimaru. Demonic art. Demon Bane, said Zanjetsu channeling a great deal of demonic chakra into Orochimaru's body causing the figure to slowly melt like wax under a large heat lamp. I've seen people dying in different manners before, but that was some crazy, said Tayuya hoping she never had to die in such a way that looked extremely painful. Get used to it since when we fight Leaf it's going to be on earth and this time we are going to win. You all know why said Kenpachi grinning behind his mask waiting for them to answer. Because we're stronger than we were before, said Sakin wondering if his answer was correct. Because we're more skilled in the shinobi arts, said Ukan appearing behind his brother curiously to give his opinion. Because we can kick a lot of, said Tayuya grinning a grin that meant trouble to all that crossed her path. Because we are smarter than before, said Kitamaru scratching his head with his top right arm all the while wondering about the question in general. Because we're survivors, said Jirobo remembering how each and every one of them had come close to death. Because we are loyal to you and only to you Kenpachi-sama, said Kimamaro not stating it as a question, but as a fact that he knew could not be disputed before picking up the only thing within Orochimaru worth retrieving his Kusanagi Sword of the Heavens. The answer is superior attitude and a superior state of mind. Though in actuality all five of you are indeed correct with your choice of an answer, said Kenpachi knowing that his response was both correct and appreciative for them to hear. With Orochimaru they would have been punished in getting such a question wrong. With Uzumaki Kenpachi they were right regardless of the response they just gave. Above them sky turned blood red and the sun was east with the face of the Shinigami himself etched into darkness. It was the signal that Zanjetsu had created for all those they had gathered during the time he and Kimamaro traveled together would recognize. It was the sign for all of them they contacted to gather at this one spot where the scary looking face of the Shinigami shinned down on them at its brightest and right now this was the spot that was now bathed in the eerie light. The hidden sound village and the sound shadow were now dead or no more. Long live the hidden Shinigami village and the death shadow. Omake, Uzumaki residence day 2 of the destruction of sound village. I'm bored and hungry. Can we eat something? Or we can play a game? said Yakiru hopefully sitting on top of the dinner table her feet dangling off of it swaying back and forth. 
Okay let's play Yakiru eats the moldy stuff on the pipe under the sink, said Akaku with his head down on the said dinner since he was completely tired from playing with the girl already. You. Baldi Chan you know some weird games, said Yakiru pouted at the prospect of playing such a game. Will you stop calling me that? Yelled Akaku, who wanted nothing more than to strangle the girl for calling him that while the two women residents of this place, who were in the next room, laughed at his unfortunate expense. It was bad enough to call him bald, but fruity as well as bald was just low. I guess I could, but only if you play one of my games, said Yakiru with her eyes glinting in a somewhat evil if not fox-like look within them making Akaku somewhat nervous. What game is that? said Akaku not noticing the two women watching with interest at what game Yakiru thought of. Keep Yakiru off your lollipop-shaped head said yakiru ing her before she started grinning showing her fox-like teeth making akaku pale and try to run only to be caught five seconds later with the girl's jaws of death biting into his skill ah get her off get her off bad y-a-c-h-i-r-u bad ow 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 yelled akaku running around in circles trying to pry the girl off of him to no avail as she was on him like stink on a monkey it didn't help him when she was holding onto the back of head while biting down on it hard and repeatedly like it was candy. Should we help him? Said Yugido looking at Rin as they watched the two interact and seeing Akaku find a filled water bottle with sprayer attached that was used to water the house plants. No need since Akaku figured out how to get Yakiru off of him, said Rin nearly falling over with later after seeing Akaku spray Yakiru in the face with water making the girl leap onto the dinner table and hiss viciously at the man before laughing at his misfortune while he patted his bald slightly bleeding head wincing upon touching all the sore spots. Come here you little brat. You want to play games? Fine. Here is one for ya. Chase Y-A-C-H-I-R-U around so when Akaku captures her he can't turn her into our dinner for tonight. Yelled Akaku chasing after Yakiru in a circle while the girl laughed at his expense before making a sharp turn right faster than the man could see. The end result crashed Akaku into the wall leaving his imprint on it as clear as day. That's not a good game Bald Chan. Looks like I get to call you Bald Chan for just a little while longer. By Bald Chan I'm going to go draw said Yakiru skipping up the stairs to her and Kenpachi's shared room. He may have figured out one thing, began Rin while shaking her head and sighing at Madarami's Ikaku's stupidity. But he has yet to fully understand Yakiru's methods, ended Yugido shaking her head as well as sighing at how this currently twitching body of a ninja could be outsmarted so badly by that fox girl. Sadly though, the two could not be ones to talk about something so embering as this as they each, much to their shame, had similar imprints of themselves on different walls and floors of the houses. Yakiru may be a naive half-demon fox, but she was a good trickster nonetheless. End Omake Chapter 8 Honoring the Dishonored The news of the village hidden the sound being destroyed along with Orochimaru, and his right-hand man Kabuto, who were both traitors to Konoha shook all the elemental countries to their foundations. Even more so was the fact that a new hidden village was built right on top of sound only after a few days of seeing the Shinigami's face on the moon that night. About a month into the new village's secret construction, two black coffins appeared out of nowhere covered in and leaking out blood one dark cloudy morning right in the village square of Konoha for all to see. Each coffin bore the symbol of the Shinigami on top of them and the blood from each handcrafted death box didn't seem to stop and next to the coffins were five tall black robed druids two per object standing as still as statues with the leader out in front of them. The only thing giving away the fact that they weren't statues was they were all in chorus with one another it was only after the several Anbu, Tsunade, Jiraiya, and the council arrived did the citizens of the Leaf start to calm down knowing such a group could protect them. Near the crowd was the rookie 8 having been renamed after Naruto had been reclified as a SSCL missing ninja. Such an action shortly happened after the large crate filled with the remains of hunter ninjas had been delivered by the three-tailed demon fox to the council meeting room with Tsunade that eventful day. She had argued, threatened, and do everything in her power to force them to stop such a horrible decision, but in the end they had overruled her and done it anyway shipping out the latest bingo books less than an hour after doing so. Now she was staring at a five agents of death though they were of a different sort than the ones she is used to and the fact she couldn't see their faces beyond the thick robed face coverings disturbed her. Were they friend? Foe? Something in the middle? It was always hard to tell with the people, who hide their faces with masks. She mentally winced thinking of Naruto with his, mask, 
on and how it had hidden his pain for so long. Kami she missed him. Reluctantly putting the thoughts of her little brother in the back of her mind once more she approached with Jiraiya and several Anbu to the lead druid, who made no movement whatsoever other than to continue with the chorus. You are the leader of this group, said Tsunade trying to vocally overpower the druid's singing before she decided to lose her temper. The leader of the group tilted his head to the side before setting it straight and nodding a barely noticeable nod while continuing his singing not missing a beat with the others behind him. If that is the case then are you from the new hidden village that built over sound, said Jiraiya looking at the druid carefully trying to measure the druid's chakra signature only to find it was masked perfectly against even him. If possible the chorus from the druids got even louder thus making Tsunade's temper get shorter at both her and Jiraiya being ignored disrespected. Listen, if you don't tell me, who you are and what is in those bleeding boxes behind you I'm going to beat the crap out of you, said Tsunade nearly yelling as the chanting had not stopped once making everyone watching feel uneasy the two sanin with a cage were intimidating the uninvited guests. Hiyashi himself had tried using his Byakugan on them only to shut it off before the veins on the side of his eyes even appeared as he shock froze him to the bone. What the clan head had seen in that very moment was not something he wanted to relive again as he saw beyond the robes was absolutely nothing. No life. No chakra network. No charka period. Only death locked away behind flimsy black robes. Slowly the lead druid raised his gloved hand making the people around him hold their breaths and the shinobi discreetly getting ready to attack should the druid try something. However, surprising nothing happened as the hand was raised to the right of his head and the druids behind him slowly stopped their chorus in a smooth fashion. If you want to know what lays in the coffins all you have to do is open them, said the silent whispery voice of the lead druid before turning to the side to let them pee. For a guy who can sing loudly he sure has a whispery voice, thought Jiraiya wanting to sweat drop it, but decided against it due to the seriousness of the situation. This better not be a trick, said Tsunade walking over to the two black rectangle-shaped boxes supported by the unnaturally raised earth that represented death and hesitated now being closer to the blood that laid on and around the coffins. Jiraiya was instantly next to her putting a hand on her shoulder knowing of the woman's fear of blood reminding the slug Sanin of her dead lover and brother. The toad Sanin also suspected that his teammate feared that one of these coffins held a bleeding and dead Naruto holding the cursed necklace that belonged to the first Hokage. The toad Sanin suspected it because he feared the same thing too. Now in front of one of the coffins that was on the right the two druids opened the casket revealing the remains of a cut, sliced, and ultimately dead Kabuto. The man had a look of pure horror in his eyes, as if his soul was now literally in and his eyes on his face were somehow connected to it. Scary thought, thought Tsunade and Jiraiya at the same time before heading to the next coffin in question and when they opened it they saw the liquid remains along with bones of their former teammate, Sanin. Holy! yelled Jiraiya leaping back along with Tsunade, who like him was now, scared at the sight of what they saw. Whatever happened to these two former sound ninja they had suffered dearly for their past crimes and had they had any empathy they would have pitied the two. Fortunately, since those past crimes involved the two Sanin there was no pity to be had. Shikij sama expects full payment for both Orochimaru of the Sanin along with the amount for his right-hand man Kabuto as well, said the lead druid looking at the two remaining Sanin, who currently were pale as snow in the face at the moment though it was more from seeing the two bodies than the fact that the overall payment would strain Konoha even more. The majority of the council of course would have none of that. Sorry, but you can only receive a bounty that belongs to Kabuto for both him and his master, said Danzo while silently fuming inside that his silent partner in crime to his plans went up in smoke. If I recall correctly from what I was told, when it comes to all hidden villages if you have more than one bounty you get the amount for each confirmed kill you present to the village in question, said the lead druid looking at Danzo's direction, while the said man felt nervous under the druid's stare or rather the unseen one. We make the rules here in Konoha you lowly druid and we say you only get the amount for Kabuto to cover him along with Orochimaru, said Kakashi trying to determine just how much of a threat they were and who was there, Shikij sama was it. Very well then, if you will not meet the required demands we will take them elsewhere and receive the necessary payment from another hidden village these two have wronged. I'm sure Suna will be more than willing to pay the necessary amount for these two due to the sand sound invasion. In the meantime I would expect you to receive a very angry letter from the fire daimyo after Shikij-sama informs him of your shrewd and highly dishonest policies, 
said the lead druid before he made a motion with his hand again to the others behind him as they proceeded to close the coffin and began to sing in chorus again. No wait. We will pay the amount, said Tsunade quickly knowing that whatever killed them was not human and needed to be investigated under her watchful medical eyes. Tsunade. Have you lost your mind? We can't pay them that amount it will cost the leaf village dearly, said Mitokado Homura not wanting to give anyone from outside the leaf their precious money, especially when it was needed to help train Uchiha Sasuke for the Chunin exams and eventually when the boy became their sixth Hokage. Shut up Homura. I am Hokage here and right now this is a military matter that falls right under my jurisdiction not you or the other council members for that matter. These two will need to be examined by me to determine the cause of their death and while I make a complete medical report I will have my eyestand Shizun give you your money for the shikage, said Tsunade knowing that if the village officially refused it would be another smear on it and her own grandfather's legacy when both he and her great uncle founded Konoha. Tsunade-sama we object to this, said Danzo becoming infuriated at the woman. That's Hokage-sama to you Danzo and don't you forget it, said Tsunade glaring at the one-eyed and one-armed former leader of Root. We will deliver the two coffins to the necessary rooms. Please do lead the way Hokage-sama, said the lead druid, who if Tsunade didn't know any better had a hint of humor in his voice. Jiraiya thought the same thing too and made a mental note to have his spy network focus more attention to the new hidden village that now replaced sound. Of course such thoughts were discontinued as the druids all began singing their chorus as they closed the coffins and followed the slug Sanin Hokage to the hospital ignoring the looks from the populace. Hidden mist village at the moment, so are you in, said Rin looking at Akaku who looked at them in shock at hearing the plan on taking over mist and water country in order to heal the deep wounds that had been delivered to it via the bloodline civil war. Akaku was in conflict with himself at the moment as he struggled between his loyalty to the mist and to the man the people he just started working with. In all honesty, Akaku wanted to stay with the mist since he had been born, raised, and trained in its arts as a shinobi. However, the state that it was currently in, plus the information Rin and all the others had given him questioned such loyalties to the Mizukage and Water Daimyo. The bald-headed man remembered when he was a boy and took up the sword as an apprentice to a former seven swordsman of the mist that it was for a cause he would always fight for and he could believe in as long as what he believed in was noble. Right now Mist wasn't so noble anymore and the fact that his sensei had just set up a new hidden village where sound used to be was another factor. From what Rin had told her of the ploy, Kenpachi had to stay in water country for a little while longer to make sure that Konoha would discover that Shinigamigakur no Sato was founded by him. That was the main reason why Zanjetsu would take up the position as temporary shikage. Then when Rin and Yugido took over water country and mist, Akaku would be given the option to move back into the ranks of mist if he so chooses to or move into Shinigami to serve the official shikage that would Kenpachi. My whole life I spent in this place living my life struggling to survive until I became old enough to enter the ranks of the mist and become the shinobi I am now. On every single mission I took I have fought hard, learned, and killed from my enemies to make myself stronger. Now I find that I cannot do that here because of how things are run and my only shame in the matter is I chose to ignore the problems around me hoping they would go away if I fought hard enough. I need to follow and support Kenpachi-sama wherever he goes and fight whoever he fights because I know that he is not blinded by his new title and power like other people have become in his position. So to that end no matter what happens I pledge my undying loyalty, my very sword, and life to Kenpachi-sama, said Akaku as he envisioned the path leading to his fate appear before him and how to walk the line as it grew before his eyes. Good to hear Akaku-san. Now we just have to find some of the remaining apprentices to the seven swordsmen and everything will be perfect, said Yugido knowing that by now the rumors of Shinigamigakur no Sato was spreading like wildfire. That will be easier said than done. I know of another apprentice like me, but the thing is that he's a bit fruity in my opinion, but I think I can convince him when I see him. Then there is another, who was originally born in the slums of mist and grew up there as a kid. He was found by one of the much older members of the Seven Swordsmen and like me the guy was heavily trained in the arts of the Mist Shinobi. The only difference is that he was trained on the mainland of the elemental countries more than he was here. If I know him like I think I do he's in a bar somewhere getting hammered deep in jungle country, said Akaku though in his mind why the place was named it despite the land being well populated with an equal amount of people as there was vegetation was beyond him. 
The land of jungle country was in itself as its name said it was a land of jungles with plants and animals of many different species looming around every corner. However, the real meaning behind the country's name was that it was an actual jungle in terms of both the civilization and that of the actual wilderness surrounding its people. The said people that founded the cities in the country built high steel walls around them to prevent the more predatorily bred beasts in the jungles outside of the walls from entering though that happened on random occasions nonetheless. It also explained to the other countries why the guards that protected its people had such great health, medical, and life insurance plans all rolled up in one. Well then at least we know where to look for them, said Uzumaki Kenpachi walking into the room wearing similar dark crimson trench coat as Zanjetsu did, but with his hair normal without having the bells in his hair and not super spiky to hold them. The eye patch and Yakiru still clinging to one of his shoulders stayed the same. How is the hidden Shinigami village progressing, said Yugito wanting to know like the rest of them how everything is going in the new village. Pretty good. Zanjetsu Sama is the temporary Shikage until our business here in Mist is officially over and Kimamaro is working with the Shinigami 4 to help regulate all the necessary parts of the village. I was actually quite surprised at how they were able get so many people to join up all at once though I asked Kimamaro to run a background check on all of them thoroughly to ensure we don't have any spies from any unwanted villages. As much as I respected old man Sandane, he let too many spies infiltrate his village and through that it cost Konoha much during the sand, sound invasion, said Kenpachi sitting down on the comfy sofa with Yakiru jumping from her perch on his shoulder to his lap. Not like it matters Ken-chan. You're going to crush them all anyway for the bad things they did you when you were younger. Take no prisoners, said Yakiru, who laughed as if what she just said was a joke. For the most part yeah. However I'm going to have those, who are good to me still be saved from my Shinigami ninja, said Kenpachi knowing from what his spies hiding in the shadows of Konoha learned that there were still people in it that supported him. I still can't believe Zanjetsu gave you demonic druids to work with. Aren't the people in the village afraid of them? Said Akaku looking at his superior officer and teacher and wondered how he got himself into this. Oh yeah now I remember. I got my kicked, thought Akaku while his inner Akaku was crying tears of sorrow at being beaten by someone younger than him. That and being bald, but that's nothing new. Not really. The druids don't hurt anyone and rarely ever interact with the people in the village if not at all so the fear of such things happening are unfounded, said Kenpachi stroking the fox ears of his daughter, who snuggled into his chest purring in content with the feel of her fox like ears being maged. Akaku for the most part when he learned about Yakiru took the news in the true form of the half-demon fox girl rather well. He had screamed like a little girl before fainting, but other than that he didn't belittle the girl or call her mean names like, half-breed, or, demon spawn, like many other untrustworthy people would in his place. Akaku for the most part had no problem with Yakiru being a half-demon and had stated that clearly to Kenpachi when he had awoken from his fainting. Granted Kenpachi had his sword to less than an Ikaku's eye when asked, but it was the truth. I'm just glad that Orochimaru and Kabuto are gone. I have heard too many stories about those two for a lifetime, said Rin remembering the Sanin when she was still a genin and heard how Kabuto backstabbed the leaf during the Chunin exams. From the amount given for the bounty on them both being dead it will go a long way in funding Shinigami and no doubt attract the attention of several high-priced clients, said Akaku after reading the latest information from Bingo Book. That and more Akaku since Orochimaru and Kabuto were only the beginning of many since it's quite clear by now to Akatsuki if they haven't already figured it out that they've lost two more members of the organization. They know that I'm not the chump they all thought I was and for the first time since the hunt for all nine-tailed demons started they have become afraid of me. They know I will go on the offensive soon and when I decide to I'm going to enjoy hearing them scream as they beg for mercy. It will be music to my ears right before I rip out their lungs along with their throat, said Kenpachi releasing a teeth showing grin like that of a fox as he laughed at the prospect. Unknown location, so it's been confirmed. Hidan and Kakuzu are both deaf said Payne getting a nod from the remaining members hearing the information and considerably shocked by the news. It's also been confirmed Orochimaru and Kabuto are dead as well. Those two were both killed apparently by the new Shikage, who founded his new hidden village right over the remains of Sound itself, said Itachi not liking this one bit though he was relieved that the Uchiha bloodline was now safe from the hands of Orochimaru and his foolish ambitions. At least he's out of the way yeah. 
we can focus on more important things now with the Sanin dead yeah, said Didera happy with the fact that the Sanin was dead since he had ample knowledge of what was going on in the organization. True, but this could hinder us later on. We tried sending a few spies in already and every time they entered the village only for them to be killed shortly after interrogation making them more aware of us. The person that tests them is said to be a human lie detector, who can tell if a person is lying just by looking into their eyes, said Sasori not liking this one bit since there was no hidden village yet that could prevent them from spying on. Do we even know who the Sheikage is, said Conan looking at all of them hoping that at least one of them had done their jobs right. It's hard to get a description of him since our spies get caught and any message they try to send could possibly be intercepted by another ninja from the village. From what we were able to get from the bits and pieces that got out before we lost contact with our spies they said the Sheikage always wears a thick dark robe with a hood so big you cannot see his face. Only the darkness that consumed it, said Itachi, who had his curiosity about this Sheikage grow upon hearing more about it. How troublesome, said Toby sighing knowing this was going to be a pain in the while the Uchiha Mandara in him planned for the future events that would soon unfold. Konoha 30 minutes later, the five druids that delivered the two coffins were walking and heading out of Konoha with the lead druid, out in front having been paid. The people around them moved children away telling them to stay away from them while giving the robed figure glares. Some of the adults were silently muttering curses at them calling them weirdos, freaks, and of course, demon worshippers, on account that they appeared to be anything, but human to oceate with the darkness. Regardless if they were all walking in a bipedal state or not the people living in the leaf village were still considered them unwelcome in Konoha. As for the druids themselves they were soon intercepted in the space between the doors leading to their exit of the leaf village by Anbu root squads with a total number of 16 ninjas in full battle ready gear. They were under the command of the council and Danzo ordered them to retrieve the money back they were taking back to the Sheikage. Druids of the Sheikage hand as the money given to you or you will be placed under arrest for stealing from Konoha, said the Anbu root captain while he and the rest of his men drew their weapons should there be a fight. You are making a big mistake Anbu captain for if you prolong our delay back to our cage any longer he will consider this an act of war. Something I doubt your Hokage will approve of your actions, said the lead druid once more as still as a statue along with the others behind him. We are under orders to take back what you have stolen from the Hokage by her fellow council members so we will are going to Yume that she wishes this as well, said the Anbu root captain though it was obviously a lie on his part about the Hokage wishing for them to take back the money. We will not give back what was rightfully given to us by your Hokage and if you try you will regret it, said the lead druid sensing the growing crowd watching wondering how this would play out in the end. Kill them and salvage anything useful from the corpses, said the Anbu root captain readying his sword at the five druids, who stood perfectly still as if they had nothing to be afraid of. And they didn't. Just as the Anbu root team charged at the druids a heavy round black object linked with a chain creating a crater five feet wide and four feet deep making the ninjas scatter. Honestly now did you really think Shikage sama would send five druids without making sure they were all protected by the ninja that serve his village? said a figure on top of a nearby roof wearing all black except for a tan-colored trench coat while wielding what appeared to be a very menacing sword looking down on the ninja team as a larger figure next to him retracted the large ball into his hand. What the? Who are you? said one of the Anbu root members wearing a wolf mask and readying himself for a fight. Considering your level of skill as a ninja you are unworthy to know any of our names except that you will address our squad leader with respect. As for who we are, we are, but one of many groups of the loyal ninja of the Sheikage himself and behind me are some of the best warriors at his command, said a warrior wearing mostly blue, with his arms bearing the colors of orange mixed with black in striped form, and he was wearing a demon mask. You better let those druids pee or there will be some to pay if you don't from us, said the smallest of the group with a needle-like nose, who was on top of the biggest and arguably the fattest member of the group. It's not like we're asking you to kill yourselves, though if you want we'll gladly give you to opportunity by fighting us, said the long red curly haired man, who threw the ball with chain at the root ninja only to throw the ball into the air slightly several times to dare the Anbu to try. Captain, what do we do? We have our orders, but we have to protect all the villagers as well or the council and the Hokage will have our heads, said an Anbu with a cat mask on. 
The said captain looked on between the group of fighters, the people, and the eerily quiet druids before coming to the all-knowing conclusion that while they outnumbered them, it would be hard to defeat an enemy whose skills were unknown. Especially when there is the possibility of innocent civilians being captured, harmed, or killed in the process. Let them pee. We have no choice, but to let them return to the sheikage. We can't risk a potential macker in Konoha against unknown foes, said the Anbu root captain as he sheathed his blade, which the other's ninjas did with their weapons. It seems Leaf made a very wise choice, which I find very rare for ones is so stupid to hurt the former, hero, of the Leaf as the late Yandaimi wanted him to be called, said the one called the, leader, of the group of ninja before nodding to the druids to start leaving. When the druids were out of sight the Anbu root ninjas turned to face the strange and mysterious Shikage ninjas only to find they had vanished as well. Danzo-sama and the council aren't going to like this, said the Anbu root captain before they all went, poof, to see their superiors and report in their failure. Shinigami village several days later, how did it go, said Zanjetsu sitting behind the desk as the druids handed him the large bag of money from the combined payments from the bounty on Orochimaru and Kabuto. Not too much trouble Zanjetsu Sama though Konoha Leaf ninjas tried to stop us under the command of the council and a man named Danzo, said the lead druid before giving his full report on the issue. It was a good thing I had Aoshi and his team watch over you. I think that when the next Chunin exams rolls around in Konoha we'll have our teams enroll and show the leaf just who we are, said Zanjetsu dismissing the druids to the darkness they came from. Zanjetsu Sama I have received word from Tazuna from Wave Country and the people fully support the trade agreement we set up between them and our village. They were most anxious to begin trade talks when told, who founded the Shinigami village, said Kimamaro appearing from the shadows behind Zanjetsu while wearing a fox mask quite similar to Kenpachi's own. Good. Set up a meeting with the case cage next and have him come here for the meeting, as to make the leaf worry about what is happening around them, said Zanjetsu knowing that Gara would have no problem signing an alliance treaty. At once Zanjetsu Sama, said Kimamaro bowing his head before re-entering the shadows and heading to Suna. With that settled Zanjetsu now turned to his greatest nemesis that even he himself found was becoming impossible to defeat paperwork. Can Pachi better take care of Mist soon because I am not going to do this for him when he officially becomes the Shikage, thought Zanjetsu hating this horrible amount of work already and it was only the late morning and he still had five more stacks to go. Konoha council meeting room two hours later, you idiots. Yelled Tsunade slamming her fists on the meeting table, which thanks to a seal designed by Jiraiya absorbed the power behind the blow preventing the table from breaking into splintered sawdust. Her yell however, was heard throughout Konoha and possibly reached the windows of the fire daimyo himself. That doesn't sound good, said the fire daimyo before returning back to reading his morning paper and drank his late morning tea. How could you even think of sending Anbu much less root Anbu after druids that belong to the Sheikage? And for what I ask you. For the money that they rightfully mind you, earned in killing Orochimaru, Kabuto, and Sound Village all in one single moment. You are lucky that the letter attached to the messenger bird the Sheikage sent us stated that our ninja made a mistake and hoped we didn't make it twice. Also he pointed out that if we don't be more courteous to his people in the future or if we prevent them from joining our next Chunin exams they will report this to the fire daimyo and offer to replace us as his main form of ninja protection. Effectively cutting off all funding to us and thus ending the village my grandfather founded, said Tsunade scowling at all the council members, who had been trying to undermine her since she first arrived in Konoha as the Hokage. But Hokage-sama you don't realize that amount of money could go to training more Anbu or the Uchiha prodigy or, said Kakashi only to be silenced by Tsunade's ever terrifying death glare. You are lucky I don't smash you to pieces myself right now Kakashi since you are still needed in the Uchiha's development not to mention working on the teamwork needed between him, Kiba, and Sakura, which from what I've read in your report is average at best, said Tsunade having read the newly formed team's report along with the others. Naturally, the council protested in not promoting Sasuke before and long after the two Chunin examiners made their recommendations. Even more was that Inazuka Sum and Yasha Haruno protested on the fact their children didn't advance either, but were silenced when Tsunade pointed out that neither child made it past the preliminaries. Guy wanted to take Lee on as his personal protege, no surprise there, after Neji received his Chunin rank along with Shikamaru, but was denied due to the need to reform the Genin teams to use in the next Chunin exams. 
As it stood Shino would have to retake the Chunin exams again due to not facing anyone during the finals, along with Choji, Tenten, Ino, Lee, and Hinata in making new Genin teams under the same, or different, sensei. The new Team 7 would be Sasuke, Sakura, and Kiba under Kakashi. The new Team 8 would be Hinata, Shino, and Lee under Kurenai with Guy still being Lee's personal taijutsu trainer. The new Team 9 was Ino, Tenten, and Choji under Asuma, who after some threats from Tsunade decided to work harder than he did with the original Ino Shika Cho. Sasuke hates working with others, while Kiba only trusts Akamaru with that starting to be strained due to the dislike of Kiba's new smug behavior in having Hinata as his soon-to-be bride, and Sakura just won't do any type of training without Sasuke. Though I'm sure coming right down to it that they will all work well together and make it to the third part of the exam, said Kakashi giving his patented U-shaped eye of a smile. They better Kakashi and if you make any of your students late again I will have he, she, or Kami help you all three of them disqualified on the spot when their designated battle starts. Unlike the third Hokage I am not going to try and amuse the stadium-sized mob of traitor-loving Uchiha fans of this village so help me Kami, said Tsunade sending some killer intent at the Junin Cyclops making the man shudder slightly after the woman stormed out of the room. Not like it matters. Whether they win or lose we'll still make them all tune in before that day is out and produce a much better clan within the week, said Danzo seeing as how the power was now officially under the council's direct control after some very very clever political maneuvering after the recommendations. That meant every decision that was made in regard to promoting Chunin were now under his direct control regardless of the Hokage's protests. Hokage's office moments later, can you believe those fool Shizun? They think they can just weasel out of everything because of their position and where they live. They can't see just how big a target they place on themselves and by the time they see that, it will be too late, and they will be all dead, said Tsunade sitting in her chair and slumping in it before letting out a heavy sigh from all the frustration she was facing. Tsunade-sama please calm down, I know it seems hopeless, but we just have to try and press forward or else all will be lost, said Shizun with the spoiled pig Tonton letting out several encouraging, oinks, to state her opinion in the matter. I know Shizun it's just becoming too difficult at times to hold this place together and every time I want to leave I see my family staring at me with a frown, said Tsunade, as she looked out the window and looked at the Hokage heads that came before her all the while wondering what they would have done in her place. Both biological and surrogate correct, said Shizun looking at the woman wondering if she included Naruto into that family as well. You know what I'm talking about Shizun. If only I could find some way to locate and communicate with him somehow, said Tsunade knowing that her summons were pissed off at the village though the slug queen herself knew that Tsunade had no power over such things so allowed the Sanin to still be her summoner. Jiraiya was not so fortunate. Apparently Gamabunta was livid at the fact that Jiraiya knew just who Naruto's father was and still treated the kid like he was nothing. Taking the kid's money when finding Tsunade, not bothering to help in Naruto's training on the Rasengan, and telling him to do said training on his own instead being more interactive with the blonde youth. Jiraiya also soon discovered that when push came to shove of a pissed off summons that depending on the summons can appear in the human world for a short time. In that short time Gamabunta pounded the Sanin into the ground before literally throwing him into the Leaf Hospital where he was treated for broken bones, fractured skull, concussion, a broken nose, and hair loss from being what seemed to be scalped off by a sharp blade. On a lighter note the WoW Springs on the female section was safe to use for several months without the feel of someone peeping on the other side. Kumo Village Rakage Tower Two months later, the Yandaimi Rakage was livid hearing that his informants had failed him yet again in finding out who was behind the alt on his outpost near Wave Country. Ever since his informants revealed that Mist along with all of Water Country had gone under a dramatic change in government things had been going downhill. With the death of the late Water Daimyo and his brother that was the Mizukage, the warring factions had stopped trying to kill each other. Rumor had it that they stopped once information from both the Mizukage and Water Daimyo's own personal journals were revealed that they had planned this from the start. Such information immediate got everyone's attention in an outside of water country, as it meant that given time the hidden mist village would once more rise to its former glory that it had been infamous for. It didn't help that both Mizu and Kumo had been at each other's throats prior to the bloodline civil war on the account that Kumo refused to follow a simple trade agreement before the late Sandame Rakage took office. 
What made the Yandaimi Rekage even angrier was that he soon learned that the new and apparently improved Mizukage was none other than Kumo's own demon vessel Niyugito. She was supposed to be his weapon, his pet, and his slave for as long as he had wished it to be so. If and when she became boring or had defied him too many times for his liking he intended to sell her off to the Akatsuki organization for a substantial profit. Now that Niyugito was the new Mizukage of Mist he found her to be at the moment to be untouchable due to the woman's newfound loyalty in her people, who along with few anonymous figures, freed the people from the harsh life of old, and brought them new ones. If he were to attack her now it would be total disaster on his end for he would need approval from his own daimyo to begin such a thing. Not only that, but the new water daimyo was a female also, who seemed to have small thing for dogs and even signing an apparent contract with a dog tracking team as well. Upon her identity being revealed as Inazuka Rin it became apparent as to why such the woman had such close ties to dogs due to her bloodline limit. It was almost humorous as well as ironic to see both cat and dog work together rather than tear each other apart like nature intended. Also more reports came in about the new Shinigamigakur no Sato than he would have liked since they were the new village and already their Shikage as he was called was a major player in the shinobi world not seen since the Yandaimi Hokage first took office in Konoha. There were rumors flying all over about the man, woman, or what the figure was seeing as how some said the cage wasn't human at all. The reports stated that the Shikage took on missions himself to not become weakened by sitting in a desk filled with paperwork and had actually found a way to conquer it. Not beat it, not win against it, but actually conquer the thing. There were some reports in front of him about the mysterious ninja, though mostly being rumors or whispers that had been heard from the dead or dying shinobi from various villages, missing ninja, or those categorized simply into, other, column. The entity that was the first death shadow of the village hidden in the Shinigami in just a few months time had taken on all comers, who thought they could knock him and his hidden village down a peg. The village hidden in the rain despite the civil war they were having was the first to try and the first to find out the hard way what it was like taking on the unknown. The retaliation of the Shikage quickly made any other village think twice in trying to pick a fight or mess with the Shikage and his village. Within three days, Omegakur no Sato was almost burned entirely down to nothing with all its jutsus and knowledge in all things shinobi taken for the use of the hidden Shinigami village. There were survivors, but only those hiding in shelters that belonged to the side that the Shikage seemed to favor were worthy of being spared that coincidentally the very people losing the civil war. It was said that the Shikage himself did it all without breaking a sweat and that the only real witness to his path of destruction was one broken bleeding, and dying rain ninja, who when questioned before his delayed death spoke nonsense for a good 15 minutes. Then when the man was only mere minutes from dying, he spoke clear in whispery little sentences when telling what exactly happened so only those around him could hear his dying words. The demon of Shinigamith demon of Shinigami. The monster came at us with an unholy rage filled power that killed all, but me. When he looked down upon me it was like staring into the eye of a dragon preparing to pee judgment on my soul. Knowing that I am the dying survivor to my village's destruction is not Merceet's torture, for even now he makes me see the dead around me that I will become. Beware of the Thetamon of Shinigami, reading the echoing words that seemed to speak into the Rakage's own skull before reading the rest of the report on how the man was soon dead from sudden convulsions, but not before he began speaking again only in more randomly and muttering apologies to what seemed to be an invisible force to the now dead man. Maybe he wasn't seeing things. Maybe he actually saw someone that the doctors could not write before he died. Could he have seen the Shikage himself right in the hospital? Impossible. Then again known cannot understand the unknown when you have never faced such a very imposing being before, thought the Yandaimi Rakage wondering if he should double the guard at the gates to be extra sure the Shikage didn't decide to pay him a visit. Konoha three days later nightfall, the cold air that was running through the village at this particular night was ungodly as even the wow springs seemed to be less steamy than usual if anyone bothered to look that is. The Anbu guarding the walls and gate that night were freezing while trying to stay warm while staying hidden from potential enemies that might find their hidden position. The people that would stay awake to enjoy the nightlife stayed inside for once and went to bed early not wanting to be awake on an unnaturally cold night. How right they were about the unnatural cold part. Just as the night became unnaturally cold there was an unnatural fog-like mist flowing into the streets in the north gate that if followed heading straight would take you directly to rice country. 
the guards at the gate knew something was up and got ready to fight only to feel sleepy and fall asleep at their posts effectively preventing any of them from alerting anyone of the coming presence that would soon peek through Kanaha's walls. Walking through the empty streets, past the closed buildings, and under the cover of darkness to their desired target. The Hokage Graveyard. Contrary to what people would think the Hokages of years past were never incinerated to protect their secrets, but rather were buried with them. Their bodies perfectly intact with a preserve seal placed on them in secret to honor the fallen fire shadows along with their spouses. The said spouses were to be cremated and then be placed in an urn so they could be buried along with the one they loved. Yandaimi and his wife Uzumaki Kashina were examples of such traditions. However, if one were to prey on such knowledge from living in the Leaf Village it could prove to be a possible risk to the village later on. A said example was the ever vile Orochimaru, who was able to get the necessary DNA samples from knowing of the location to use in future failed experiments in making several human beings with the Shodime bloodline. It never occurred to anyone that the late Sandane, before he died, had repeated history once more by showing the graveyard to one other outside potential Hokage candidates. It was when the person he showed the graveyard to was just a five-year-old boy just several years before the Uchiha Macker started. That boy was, at the time, named Uzumaki Naruto. The Hokage had taken his time out for that one day to take Naruto on a special visit to the graveyard knowing that in the day the place ironically blossomed with life. It was almost as if the Shodime's bloodline was actually working even with its body long being dead for many years. On that day, the Sandame had take Naruto to pay his respects to the late Yandaimi in his own way explaining to the boy that given time all would be explained on why he was being shown such a sacred place. Unfortunately, such a day never came as Orochimaru had killed the old Sandame in the sand, sound invasion with a sword to the old man's chest. However, it had been widely believed by many in the ninja ranks had Orochimaru not summoned the other two late fire shadows to weaken the old Hokage, the man's most gifted student turned Sani, turned traitor, would have lost the battle, and his life. Now here in this graveyard of fire shadows stood a large formation of druids with half of them carrying shovels, with the other with long torches to see where they were headed, and where to begin digging when reaching the correct spot. Once they got into the correct spots where they needed to be, they started digging. Uzumaki Naruto now having renamed himself Uzumaki Kenpachi and current Shodime Shikage had decided that the four graves that held the previous Fire Shadows remains were being dishonored by the villagers themselves. It became clear to Kenpachi that all the Hokages that came before Tsunade and all they taught while living in a village had been forgotten as their years as ninja warriors seemed to be only recalled in one of the many boring little history lessons Aruka gave at the ninja academy. As if that in itself wasn't bad enough. Be careful where your shovels strike in the earth's soil. Shikage sama was very explicit on there being very little damage to the coffins as possible, said Kimamaro wearing his Anbu uniform along with a druid cloak, and fox skull mask given to him by Kenpachi himself. Kimamaro swore he would treasure and honor it by going on the most worthy of missions given to him by Kenpachi when his services were required. As such this was one of those times. Do you think anyone will notice what we are doing, said Sajin Komamura, who is now the owner of the sword that had once belonged to the late Sanin Orochimaru. The much larger masked-shaped entity appeared alongside Kimamaro who was watching like the sword owner as the druids were digging six spots in the earth. All the while Sajin looked through his mask around the area every so often for any possible interruptions that may have arise during this time of removing the coffins from the earth. Sajin, like Yakiru was a half-demon fox though unlike Yakiru had the animalistic face of a fox down to the whiskers, rather than that of a human-looking one. His face made the people, who saw him, called him, monster, demon, and various other things before he had been captured several months prior to Orochimaru's demise. He was attacked by the said Sanin after he had been heavily poisoned by the sound Anbu and was used to help the Sanin to further achieve immortality. Had it not been for the fact that the demon side and blood inside of Sajin had rejected Orochimaru's cruel attempts at possessing him via immortality jutsu, the half-demon fox more than suspected that he would have been the next vessel of the late snake Sanin. When Kenpachi, Zanjetsu, and Kimamaro entered the row of prison cells used to house failure from various experiments they had found the large fox man heavily chained with countless chakra draining seals all over his body. 
When Kenpachi ripped the prison cell door off its hinges he fried the chakra seals from the half-demon's body by overloading their powers with his own. Upon looking at the three, Sajin had immediately bowed his head to the left in shame trying to hide his face deeper into the darkness of his prison cell expecting his rescuers to look upon him with disgust before turning around to leave him in the room to rot. Much was Sajin's surprise when Kenpachi sliced through the chains holding him down with his sword before he, Kimamaro, and Zanjetsu lift him up to carry him out of the room. When Sajin was better rested Kenpachi paid him a visit without the spiky bell at the tips like hair, but a more piv version of the man though the eye patch remained on the right eye. He also saw a half-demon fox girl on his right shoulder looking at him with interest, as if she had never seen anyone like him before. After much talking later Sajin pledged his entire life to Kenpachi though the latter told him it was unnecessary as he did it for a fellow outcast like himself. That he too knew what it was like to be called such harsh names when no one around you had any right to judge you without even getting to know you. If anything that little part of the conversation brought Sajin's loyalty practically up to the equivalent level of Kimamaro's own loyalty. It was almost scary. Still, such scars from the past do not fade easily and as such Sajin wished to hide his fox-like facial appearance from the world via a wooden-shaped mask that surrounded his entire face. Kenpachi agreed on the terms that one day, he would remove the mask and would stop wearing it afterwards. A term that Sajin reluctantly, but willingly agreed upon since there was always a chance that the mask could be destroyed in battle. The mask itself was designed by Sajin himself so he could see out of it with small thin light lines in the front and due to his keen fox-like eyes anyone thinking that half-demon fox was at a disadvantage was very mistaken. Not until tomorrow morning or a few days after I imagine. Very few know of this place let alone wish to guard it due to the secrecy of where the graveyard is. However, should I be wrong I know I can count on you to help me vanquish any and all obstacles that stand in our way, said Kimamaro, who knew the Sajin was like him and loyal to the Sheikage and followed the eye patch wearing death's shadow without question. Moments later one of the smaller groups of the druids digging stopped having reached his target, he then moved his shovel away before brushing away the dirt, picked up the wooden box containing the desired item inside, and then with black gloved hands gently picked the box that they had been digging for that was under the Yondime's tombstone. Carefully the druid walked over to Kimamaro, kneeling on one knee, opened the box lid, and presented the large golden object to the right-hand man of Kenpachi, who took it just as carefully as the druid had the protective wooden casing. It was the urn of Uzumaki Kashina. Can you hear her sorrow? She crying, said Sajin, who received a single nod from Kimamaro, who took the urn away for safekeeping. What did you expect? She is crying over what this village has done to her son since her death in bringing him into this world. However, that will stop once she is carefully in her new resting place especially made for her by Shikage sama said Kimamaro hearing the cries of the woman's soul on how they could hurt her precious little boy like that. Yes. Her along with the others, said Sajin looking at the druids digging deeper for the coffins that contained the four late Hokage's remains. One of five down with four holes to dig left. You do know it is against the law of any place city or ninja village to rob a grave much less that of a late cage right, said Hatake Kakashi a nearby tree above them reading his perverted book casually as if the people below him were nothing to him. He wasn't alone either as 20 Anbu ninja were all around the group below with weapons drawn ready to slay the intruders for their trespassing. It seems we have been discovered, said Kimamaro looking up at Kakashi recognizing him form the bingo book seeing the man had not worn an Anbu mask like the others. Yes. How do you wish to proceed? Said Sajin glaring at Kakashi and letting out his killer intent at the man, who felt the tremendous killer intent making him put his book away getting serious. I can tell by your killing intent you're not normal, said Kakashi raising his headband to reveal his Sharingan eye that he was infamous for to help him see the truth. That I won't reveal anything to you Hata K nor will be telling you anything or what knowledge we may possess. If captured we are prepared to end our lives taking whatever secret we hold with us to protect the one we serve, said Sajin with such conviction that Kakashi believed the taller figure would indeed end his life. Also was the leaf Junin imagining things or did the same person seem to hate him for some reason? Well if that's the case then can we at least talk with some civility before we start to go at it? Like for example, I ask you a question and if you want to either of you can answer the question or not depending on what it is. How's that? 
said Kakashi almost feeling the itch to read his book again since he felt he could calm them down enough to prevent an all-out fight here. Speak your first question Hata K Tem before we decide to slaughter you along with the rest of these weaklings, said Kimamaro letting loose his own killer intent making all the Anbu on edge at feeling such hate towards their very being. Well if you want to get right into it, who am I to stop you? Alright then question number one is Thizho is the man, who that has taken the title of Shikage, said Kakashi focusing his Sharingan eye on the two hoping the two would crack under its hypnotic gaze. They didn't even blink and they didn't answer. At the moment the druids from one of the spots finished and proceeded to lift up the gold-colored coffin from the earth holding it steady in their hands. The druids then proceeded in move away from the rectangular and empty grave before stopping once more near the graveyard entrance exit. Two down with three remaining. Okay question number two Icefoot are you planning to do with the four coffins that hold our ever so sacred hokages, said Kakashi though his tone was more serious given the one of the coffins held his sensei. If you must know we are relocating them to a more sacred and secure spot away from this tainted shinobi village they once proudly called home. You dishonor them so our leader has decided that we take them someplace where they will be treated with respect, said Sajin taking a hard step forward shaking the ground slightly beneath him, Kimamaro, and the druids. Needless to say it got Kakashi's and the other leaf ninja's attention. That was a lot of force place under that single step and from the looks of it the tall guy wasn't even trying very hard, thought Kakashi narrowing his eyes at the masked giant who retaliated by letting loose an even larger amount of killing intent to snuff out the leaf junin's piercing look. Three down with two to go as the druids lift yet another coffin. Question number three are you a threat to Konoha? Said Kakashi noticing that the anbu behind were becoming tenser and wondering why the Sharingan user didn't order them to stop the druids. I'll answer your question with one of my own. Do you mean the village in general or the overall populace? said Kimamaro channeling some chakra into his mask making the eye holes flash red to intimidate the Junin and his team. Both actually, said Kakashi hearing the shoveling in the background being the only real noise in the night along with the barely heard fire from the torches that some of the other druids held. Four down with one left to dig up. Yes and somewhat no depending on who were out to kill Hata K, said Sajin leering at He-Man while letting out a small yet still dark laugh into the night. Kakashi didn't need either of the two in order to get the hint due to the bloodlust from the tall helmet one was more than enough for him. Take them alive, but don't hesitate to kill if restraining them proves a fruitless endeavor to achieve, said Kakashi drawing his kanai from his pouch ready to fight. Final coffin removed from grave mission objective completed. It would appear that the time has come to show these fools what it means to fight against the forces of Shikage sama said Sajin drawing out his sword while Kimamaro just walked over to the gates near the other druids before drawing out his bone tonpas that he had been secretly making during the conversation. You know what to do Sajin san just don't create too much noise, said Kimamaro, as he knew that Sajin would rather kill himself than willingly fail Kenpachi in any mission. Such arrogance in thinking one person could take on the son of the White Fang and his small army of Leaf Anbu beside him, said Kakashi smirking at them thinking this was going to be easier than he thought and may not even need his Sharingan. The arrogance is yours Hata K Kakashi for thinking that name alone gives you the power to best me knowing that is all you are to your late father. His worthless runt and poor excuse of a son that he didn't kill before taking his own life to remove his shame not of failing a mission, but knowing he helped conceive you, said as Sajin drew his sword revealing to them it was the Kusanagi sword that was responsible for the late Sandime's death. How dare you wield such a tainted sword against us you freak of nature, said one of the Anbu only back away several steps feeling the killer intent from Sajin increase threefold. Shut up and fight you fool leaf ninja, roared Tenken, said Sajin, as Chakra came out of his sword creating a giant version of his arm holding his sword in his hand above him before brining it down on upon the shocked ninjas. Kakashi was glad he could move as fast as he did otherwise he may have been crushed by the sheer brute force of the usual power that the giant man had displayed. Another thing that bothered Kakashi was that the man he had come to identify from his partner as Sajin did not call the Kusanagi its original name, but rather he called it Inkan. For Kakashi it made no sense since that was the sword that had slain the third and nearly killed the Tsunade when Jiraiya was sent to find her to become the fifth Hokage of Konoha. Lethal force authorized. Kill him, said Kakashi before making the hand signs for Rakiri and charged Sajin, who used his power to take out a quarter of the forces opposing him. 
Kakashi's attack would have succeed had a spiked wall of bones shop up in front of him several feet in between him and Sajin while a few shorter ones were able to stab Kakashi in the feet or ankles making him lose his Chidori in the process. As much as I would like you to deliver some much needed punishment on them Sajin san we must be going. Shikage Sama does not like tardiness when it comes to completing missions that are important to him, said Kimamaro rising to his full height slamming his hand down onto the ground using his bloodline to create a new clan technique, though it was strictly defensive one. Right behind you Kimamaro san, said Sajin, who followed the group and made their escape from the graveyard. Kimamaro. Orochimaru's bodyguard is alive thought Kakashi closing his headband over his Sharingan eye biting back the urge to scream and at the moment he really really wanted to scream. Call for reinforcements and summon Tsunade-sama to the hospital so we can help the wounded, said an Anbu ninja wearing a ferret mask before he and several others took off after the grave robbers. Little did they know this was two missions in one. Hyuga compound moments later, it didn't take long for the village alarm to sound and the Hyuga clan's giant home went under immediate lockdown preventing anyone from entering or leaving. As for Hanada herself she was awakened by the running around that could be heard outside of her door. The possibly that her sister Hanabi heard the commotion through her door as well since they were right next to each other with Neji's room being across from them being their personal protector and relative. Hanada shivered slightly as she remembered the latest Hyuga clan elders meeting her father had attended just a few days ago concerning her sister. Due to Hanada's special marriage, Hanabi was to soon to be given title of heiress to the Hyuga clan. He or she was livid that they wanted to put Neji and Hanabi together when his youngest of two daughters became of age since they wanted strong Hyuga to run the clan. He or she had immediately denounced such a union since it was not possible genetically and it was wrong morally though the elders said keeping with tradition was a must. He or she though had further explained that while Neji was indeed his nephew, which caused any form of union to not be possible due to the genetic similarities between he or she and Hazashi. Being the clan head's twin made it to be as if Neji was he or she own illegitimate son along with Hanada and Hanabi's half-brother. The Hyuga clan elders were less than pleased and planned to go another route when the right time presented itself. After all it was to ensure that Hanabi would one day be married to a strong individual of their choice they could trust to produce a strong Hyuga offspring. Now Hanada had to comfort herself with her little fox plushie her father through unknown sources was able to get her in secret since it reminded her of Kenpachi when he was still Naruto. He'll stop this marriage from happening. He won't let it happen to me I know he won't thought Hanada holding the plushy tighter wishing beyond all things that it was her foxy hero. There was a knock at her room door bring her further back to the living world away from, which she barely lingered wanting to re-enter the dream world. Hanada-sama I need you to come to the door, said a deep unknown voice from behind rice paper the door making Hanada frown as her door was not locked and could have been opened by the voice behind it. This could mean he was a servant she had yet to meet in the large house or the unknown being was an enemy that had infiltrated her home like before only this time as was to trick her and possibly innate her at her room door. Who is it? Said Hanada in a tired sleepy voice and whispered even in a more serious and lower one to activate her by a Kugan to see beyond her room. A messenger though my orders were to wait by the door to receive the message from the one whose soul belongs to you, said the kneeling figure that from what Hanada could see with her eyes was not from her clan or Konoha in general. The demon mask was, but one dead giveaway. Then the monst's words pierced through her head and her heart swelled knowing just, who the figure was talking about as only one person could think of such words to say to her. She got up from her bed and went over to the door pushing it open only to stop after two inches by the person on the opposite side. Please tell me what the message that Kenpachi is, said Hanada being as polite as she could be at the ungodly hour. I cannot speak his words for they would be tainted by me. However, I am to deliver this letter from him to you that say his words, said the demon masked wearing ninja handing her envelope with a black ink colored seal in the shape of the Shinigami's head. Thank you Onisama, said Hanada taking the envelope feeling the smoothness and the weight of the parchment inside of it. Please you honor me enough as it is by speaking to me. If anything call me Hananya if and when we meet again at a later date. For now, I must go before your cousin or sister spot me here near your room, said Hananya before seemingly teleported from her sight as she shut her door and locked it to prevent anyone else from entering. Carefully Hanada opened the envelope and unfolded the letter reading its contents slowly to Savoie in every word written on it. 
Dearest Heim of all Heims, if you are reading this then Hananya had delivered the letter successfully to you and for that I am grateful to no end. Now I know that you can once more know how much I love you with every ounce of my soul, which I give to you without hesitation. Know that I am with you always and will protect you from the shadows as I cannot be there in person. I am fully aware that you are put into unusual arranged marriage with Kiva Tem and Sasuke Tem, which as you can imagine pisses me off to no end. Make no mistake my Haim I am not mad at you since you had no say in the matter. I'm more pissed off at the bastards, who set the whole thing up while I was away and unable to do something. Ever since when Team 7's first mission in Wave Country when we were all ambushed by the Demon Brothers I have never been as powerless since then as I am now. However, I am not without ways of making sure you are safe from harm or from those two Thames pervert mainly Kibas like ways. Even now I have special agents Ignid specifically to monitor and protect you from harm, you already met one of them, so you can focus on the Chunin exams. I'm having my teams participate in that as well though between you, me, and this letter they are more than qualified for having the rank. I will be there to see you again though how I won't say until you see me on the day my teams arrive to compete in the exams. Make sure you and your team, as long as Sasuke Tem and Kiba Tem aren't with you, makes it to the third part of the Chunin exams. I know you can do it because I believe in you without hesitation and know you are strong no matter what anyone else says. Love, Uzumaki Kenpachi. The Shodime Shikage of Shinigamigakur no Sato PS here's a picture of what I look like. With that last word Red Hinata looked down at the poilograph attached to the letter of her love before her eyes went white as dinner plates. Hinata then used the last ounce of mental strength to carefully refold the letter, walk over to her bed, tuck the letter with poilograph away in her diary, sit on her bed, then proceeded to faint with steam coming out of her ears due to the letter, and a nosebleed caused from the poilograph. Kenpachi Kun is such a sexy fox, thought Hinata before re-entering her dreams that were with her and Kenpachi doing all sorts of things that would have made Jiraiya envious and want to make a super-sized novel of Ika Ika Paradise. On a hill outside the gates of Konoha 10 minutes later, do you think they will get to the safe zone in time? Said Hitsugaya Tashiro watching with interest with his ever beautiful, possibly too beautiful, and taller wife Hitsugaya Matsumoto Rangaku or Ran, as she liked to be called standing beside him. The young man had come from water country several years before the bloodline civil war started with his mother and father, who despite the growing tensions back home at the time loved each other dearly. His aunt from his mother's side of the family stayed in mist and chose to keep her bloodline limit hidden in case things became worse for those like her with special abilities. And things did get worse, but not before Tashiro's aunt met this wonderful, at least she thought, man, who helped give her a child. A child that like her had the power to change the way water could be manipulated into ice via her bloodline limit ped down as all genetic traits do from parent to child. That child's name was Haku. When Kenpachi heard of Tashiro's abilities he instantly knew just who the man had been related to sending Kimimaro and Zanjetsu to search high and low for the man. After all it was only right to inform the man of his cousin, how they encountered each other, and to regretfully inform the man Haku's untimely demise at the hands of Hata K. Kakashi. When Tashiro found out he was devastated by the news, but when he learned that Haku died nobly in battle to protect his precious person, the ice user knew it was a good death worthy of his family heritage. In light of this news the now last member, as far as Tashiro now knew, of his clan, pledged his loyalty to Kenpachi in order to continue honoring the short, but powerful friendship that had happened between the fox vessel and Haku. For Rangaku, it was simply follow her husband's lead knowing that once the man made up his mind in such a matter not even she could change his mind unless he did it voluntarily. Of course they will Shiro-chan. You should know better than to not have better faith in those two, said Rangaku leaning down and hugging her husband and consuming his head into her quite large female. Etz, making the man blush while fighting the soon-to-be nosebleed that was to come if she didn't stop. How the short man hated being called that embering nickname. Fortunately, the shorter of the two was saved from emberment when static came into their earpieces meaning someone was about to talk to one or both of them. It meant it was of the utmost importance. Toshiro-san what is the status of current situation in Konoha concerning the mission, said the voice of Kenpachi over the headset in the frosty white-haired man's ear that had made all fooling around from his wife be put on hold. The pout on her face proved she wasn't happy about it either. Everything is going according to plan sir. Hananya reported in not long ago and told me he gave Hayuga Hanada your letter. 
he also stated to me that he is going to continue his spying on Konoha while protecting Hanada until a month before the Chunin exams start, said Toshiro putting two fingers to his earpiece and relaying what was going on. Good. Can you see my retrieval team at all Rangaku-san? said Kenpachi wondering just how far his team had gotten getting what he asked for. Kimamaro, Sajin, and the large group of druids are heading their way along with what seems to be what you asked them to retrieve Shikaj-sama. However, I now see that there are some Anbu chasing after them sir and closing fast, said Rangaku frowning at this new situation as the small group of ninjas were closing in and going directly for her comrades while the village alert system that had kicked in not long ago was still wailing like a banshee. When the team I sent is safe freeze their pursuers to a standstill and smoke the life out of them, said Kenpachi with malice and hate for the Anbu, who he knew had deliberately failed to protect him despite the orders given to them by the late Sanding. Yes Shikage sama said Rangaku and Toshiro knowing that the sound behind the man's words meant to cause as much pain as humanly possible. And that also doing it as inhumanly possible wasn't a bad thing either. Sit upon the frosted heavens higher in room said Toshiro drawing his sword sending his chakra through the tip of the blade creating a large ice dragon came down upon Konoha creating an ice barrier that cut off the Anbu team's pursuit. My turn, growl Heineke, said Rangaku unleashing her own sword's power and sending her blade turned to ash upon the Anbu forces attacking them in the shape of a large cat mauling them all in the process. About 10 minutes after these attacks struck the retrieval team of Kimamaro, Sajin, and the druids carrying the coffins met up with the two waiting. It would seem our mission was a success and it's time to go home to report to Shikaj sama said Kimamaro looking to his right seeing the sudden appearance of Zanjetsu from a newly opened portal. You all did extremely well. Now let's go before the leaf reinforcements arrive to delay us further said Zanjetsu before letting them all pee into the portal and then himself letting it close just as Jiraiya along with several Junin arrived on the scene. They got away, said Jiraiya knowing from the description of the last person he saw was the one, who had led the recruitment of various missing ninja among others to join the Shinigamigakur no Sato that had sprung up over the ashes of sound. What do we do Jiraiya-sama, said a Junin with a scar along his chin area. Nothing except tell Hokage-sama that her family and predecessors have all been taken from Harie again, said Jiraiya knowing she was going to super pissed at what had just happened right under and the village's own nose meaning the super pervert was going to send to the hospital I it again good thing he was a fast healer. Thanks for listening. I hope you guys liked it. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a like for more what ifs and support the author. See you guys in the next video.